lecture. It's a political lecture. The colleagues that start with the SACP T-shirt, please come in front. Just reserve the two. You know, most there's some people whose chairs are reserved. I don't want anarchy where people take over chairs of others. Thank you very much. Can you do that? I'm doing it uh, for this one, but fourth estate. So that when they take pictures, they don't run to the empty chairs as a basis to say there were no people. Yeah, okay. Let's do that. Thank you very much. I'm going to confine myself to directing the program and give everyone who has the responsibility to speak that space. For now, we're going to be singing the national anthem. I don't know if there's recording or we're going to stand and sing. There's recording. Thank you very much. Let's stand up. You decide where your hand is so that you don't move it around. In the National Conference of the ANC, there was an argument of whether you still keep your hand up on the component that is stem. We said, if you decide to keep your hand up in the first moment, proceed until you close. So you decide where your hand is. You can proceed. Uh, thank you very much. Can those of us who are men take out our heads? Thank you. seen in the program whether there's going to be singing of international but because of the stature of the person that we have a lecture for international should be available because it's a communist uh, national anthem and we're celebrating the life of one of the outstanding communists that the Communist Party once produced, the longest serving General Secretary of the SACP. Even Comrade Blade did not uh, go beyond Kotane in terms of service. Thank you very much. You are not going to be welcomed by me. And I'm now going to call for the speaker of Matrosana.
local municipality. The member of the NYTT of the ANC Youth League, the member of the PEC of the ANC, Comrade Stella Mondlan, to come and acknowledge uh, guests. Surely she will also include me on the guests. Thank you very much. Over to you, Comrade Stella. Uh, thank you very much, uh, leadership. Good afternoon to the entire leadership that is here and also greetings to everyone that has made uh, this memorial lecture to be possible and that is yourself seated in this hall. My job is a uh, very important yet uh, very short it's to deal with acknowledgement of uh, the honorable guests that we have today. I will start off with the Northwest University Vice Chancellor, Dr. Bismarck Chobeka, the Northwest University Deputy Vice Chancellor, Prof. Jeffrey Mpahele. I would wish that as I, tr as I mention the name, they can just wave so that we can be able to attach name to face for the benefit of those that would know a name without necessarily knowing the face. Uh, I would proceed to the chairperson of the Moses Kotani Foundation, Ambassador Joseph Kotani, uh, the MEC of Health, who is also our program director for the day, and equally the provincial secretary of the SACP, Mr. M. Sambata, the MEC for Finance, who is equally the PEC member of the African National Congress, uh, the leader of government business in the Northwest, uh, Memo Tlalipule Khosho. I would proceed to the MEC of Community Safety. The expectation is that he should be here. I've not seen him. Uh, the provincial treasurer of the ANC in the province, MEC, Lehari. I, okay. And our MEC for social development, Mebuitumelo Muilwa, if she can just wave, she's there. The executive director, corporate relations and marketing, Mr. Clement Manuku. There. Thank you and also acknowledge the presence of Hosi OTS Maotwe. Uh, Hosi G. Hasiboni. Hosi Mutibi. Thank you. Professor Soma Dotafikeni. Ambassador Jerry Machila, right? Dr. Mavuso Msimanga, veteran Yarona, uh, Ms. Phoebe Potritek, all right? And I proceeding to acknowledge the presence of Mr. T. S. Mokaila. Uh, Mr. P. Defni. There we go. Thank you very much. Last but not least, let me recognize and acknowledge the presence of Mr. S. Mate. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. We wish to send our humble apologies for any esteemed guests that we might have missed from our list, but safe to say that all protocol is observed and you are welcome to the memorial lecture. Thank you. Uh, Comrade Stella, can you report to the Vice Chancellor? <laughs> report to the Vice Chancellor. Yeah, go to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much. Let's, the problem with introduction is that if you do by seeing people, you may end up not introduce the very senior to the ones you have seen. 
So each time we see uh, guests and leadership, we'll introduce them. But as I am here, I see the CEO of the Moses Kodana Foundation. CEO, can you stand up? Yes, CEO of the Moses Kodana Foundation. But I see the General Secretary of COSATU, the former Provincial Secretary of COSATU Northwest, and General Secretary currently Comrade Soli Pitwe is there next to Budmavusu. He is. And I see next to him is a Provincial Secretary of COSATU, Comrade Kopano Kunupi. Uh, can come back, Comrade Stella. Uh, thank you very much, leadership, for that assistance. The problem of being a deployee is that you confine yourself to what is written. But I appreciate the flexibility and also take the opportunity to recognize the presence of Professor Dirk Gorze, who is with us, and perhaps indicate to the House that there is one that I am not even fit to tie his shoes and therefore I'll not be introducing him. There is a designated person that will do that. Thank you very much and you are welcome. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Had to all protocols observed. We now going to this program of mine, I sometimes want to dispute it. We now going to receive Oh Ibambeni Ebafana Ibambe. composition of the attendance. Thank you very much. Someone uh, who's the head, I think that we must acknowledge, whilst acknowledging the vice chancellor, acknowledge the university council, which will include SRC and the student body and acknowledge the university management. The reason I'm doing that is that I'm a former member of the University Council. So I would have felt not okay that we are not acknowledged yet we are the hosts. We should acknowledge the University Council, especially led by the Vice Chancellor and the Chair of the University Council. It's two bodies. You are acknowledged and appreciated for taking a decision to host. We appreciate that you have decided to host us. We are now going to call uh, the Vice Chancellor. The advantage with the Vice Chancellor is that he's a former student of the same university. So the university lectured him to become the person he then became especially in South Africa. He's one of the very few, very few nuclear physicists that we have around the world and in South Africa. 
Not only that he was a student, he is one of our own in Northwest from Bujanala. But he is not a vice chancellor because he was a student or is from Northwest. People must go to school. So we are not part of that element called tautilization. Akirimantashing, it's an abrupt change of your original position. It's called mandashing. Saudism is the hatred of formal education. He is. He is not a vice chancellor because he's from, born from Northwest. The vice chancellor by qualifications and capacity. Uh, Professor Bismarck Chobeka. Please come and welcome us. Sir. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mo Kuduta Maheng, ya Prophet C. Batutlehi, Bora di Toropo, Libo Meara, Badi Toropo Tarona, Babaling Tengfa, Bakwa Lady, Ba Prophet C. Lua Wosichab, Re Mapaila, Wa Communist Party, Le Re Peto, Wa Kosat. Mudula Stilo wa Moses Kotani's foundation, Resem Kotani, Leba Lusika Bora Kotani. Mukuru Tamaha wa Moses Kotani foundation, Restif Mashia, Maho Sila Mahosana, Bukoni Bupiri, Malay Africa Bora, Kakakaretu. Kia kareta kosi kasi boni ke kosi mau tuwa baba baba nande rona fa kumpiye mu professora ara soma doda fikeni iling mudula stilo wa public service commission iling sibu isaro na sato tlo kumpiye ikuwa kwa biri taro na. Tsa Musa Balazo, our stalwarts and veterans, Tidiling Tengha, Ya Kareta, Rema Vusom Simang, Borre Pito Tolo, Babote, Kaho Farlo Hana Habona, Professor Ara, Professor Dirk Kotze, Wa University of Africa Bora, Professor Ara Warona. Mobuko Nebu Pirim, Ealing Director of School of Governance, Professor Kidiboni Paho, Badirakana, Moko Meeting at Sama Isoya University, DVCs, Executive Directors, University staff and students, Badiredi Puso Baba Lenghano. Bahai to our Totahan Dumela Dumela Honorable Premier, it is a privilege and honor for us to be the co hosts of this first annual Moses Kotani Memorial Lecture in collaboration with the Northwest Provincial Government and Moses Kotani Foundation. This marks a historic moment as we are jointly celebrating the contribution of our constitutional democracy by one of the struggle stalwarts from our province, Malume Moses Mawani Kotan. His biographer, Brian Benting, quotes Kotan's alias discourse regarding South Africa as a nation in the context 
of language. And I quote, so while in each republic or national area, everything would be conducted in the language of its people, there still remains the problem of the official language, official national language to be solved. Nevertheless, this could be settled by the common consent of all. Close quote. Malume Kotani's assertion above is a clear demonstration that he is among the leading minds in the way our constitutional democracy has been framed. In my observation, program director, this manifests at least in two ways. One, his foremost contribution into a debate regarding the multilingual character of South Africa at the time and how such a matter could be addressed. And two, his reference to a common consent of all in addressing the language question. It means that he believed in dialogue in the context of multiracial, multilingual, and a diverse South Africa. From these two observations, ladies and gentlemen, it is without doubt that our globally acclaimed constitution of 1996 captures Kotani's views. The drafters of our constitution have considered these intellectuals whose outcomes have significantly brought unity to South Africans today. However, we need to raise pertinent issues that are going to be with the nation of South Africa for several years to come. Reports from the offices of the Auditor General, Public Protector, Special Investigating Unit have demonstrated that our constitutional democracy founded upon the foundations laid by Moses Kotani and others seems to be at a crossroad. The revelations in various commissions, such as the SARS Commission, the PIC Commission, the Zondo Commission, have dampened our spirits. At the center of these is corruption, malfeasance, and extreme material gain. The future of our electricity generation also hangs in the balance. And we ask ourselves questions on what would Moses Kotani do to confront these societal malaise that have caused untold pain in South Africans today. Kotani has contributed enormously to the liberation of South Africa and the African continent, a man who was known to be incorruptible in all facets of life and demonstrated exemplary leadership by leading from the front. The caliber of the leader who dedicated his life for freedom, democracy, and advocated for strong moral principles. As leaders in our various organizations, we have a task to continue with the democracy project that sustains Moses Kotani's legacy towards building a South Africa that is just, equal, and non-discriminatory. Section 9.2 of the South African Constitution clearly articulates that equality includes the full equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms to promote the achievement of equality, legislative and other measures designed to protect or advance, advance persons or categories of persons disadvantaged by unfair discrimination may be taken, close quote. We therefore have a responsibility to educate ourselves and our communities about their political rights through continuous, robust discourses on constitutional rights. As a university, we are committed to collaborate with government to provide relevant expertise and training where needed to enhance and strengthen the capacity of the state. For example, we have an, an MOU with the National School of Government on the training of public officials 
which is implemented through our university's continuing education portfolio. We also have a partnership with the Special Investigation Unit to produce a new generation of forensic accountants. These are some of the examples of our role and contribution in building a capable state. We are further committed to provide solutions relevant to societal challenges through our teaching, learning, research and innovation as well as community engagement programs. In the quest of addressing these grim issues, including unemployment, poverty and inequality, we need to develop strategies which will assist in building our local economy. Honorable Premier, we are committed to partner with government, foundations, industry, and relevant entities to address challenges faced by communities and make social impact in the province. So, Premier, MECs, government officials, and the university management and staff, the key questions that we need to ask ourselves as we remember and celebrate the life of Moses Kotan are, one, what are we doing to sustain Moses Kotan's legacy and his dream of a free South Africa? Secondly, how would he react to our work generally and in addressing the plight of the poor? Thirdly, what would Malume Kotan say about our work ethic and selfless contribution to our communities today. Fourthly, what would he say to us about a range of reports about funds and resources that were intended for communities but never reached the people, especially those in the villages? And lastly, and but not least, what are we going to do differently after today to introspect and to self-correct. Program Director, please allow me to extend a warm welcome to everybody. I look forward to listening to all speakers this afternoon, and I'm certain that we will benefit, benefit from their wealth of knowledge and indeed from the Q&A that will follow thereafter. Kia thank you, Yabok. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor. Another warm round of applause, please. Thank you very much. We're now going to move to the next uh, speaker. And the next speaker is the only person in South Africa whose age is averaged the only one in South Africa whose age is averaged, whose birth year is averaged. All of us have a date of birth, though I also dispute mine, because the only depiction is that my mother reminds it on the basis that it was heavily raining. But Abushena is very clear. It says... 56 or 57. It says 56 or 57. There's no exact uh, year. But Brabushi, we call him Brabushi, he's the seventh premier of a uh, northwest province. So you don't just become a premier if you have not been an activist. And you don't just become a premier if your contribution could not be recognizable. So Prabhushi is one of those people who are very dedicated in political education. And I'm sure uh, Uput Mavuso would also understand that is one of the premiers who are not afraid to relate with issues based on Marxist-Leninist theory. 
Agiri, of late, when people go to government, they even forget any reference that has to do with Marx's plan in his theory as a basis of a tool of analysis that is available to us to analyze society. So Prabhupada even in Exco, he quotes uh, Marx, now as a provincial center of the Communist Party, I just keep quiet and be happy that a premier can do that. Prabhupada is the premier that succeeded. Some people say he succeeded uh, Prajob. Again, you will say so. Ne? He did not succeed Prajob. He succeeded acting Premier Hosho. Is there was a job he left, and there was an acting Premier. So Hosho must not be afraid to refer to a CV as one's having an acting Premier, because Brabushi succeeded acting Premier Hosho. So let's welcome the Premier of Northwest Province. Comrade Kaubitsa Bushima Abe to address us. Honorable Premier, Comrade Bushi. Thank you very much, uh, the Program Director. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Ambassador Kotani as chairperson of the Moses Kotani Foundation and family members if uh, they are here. I want to acknowledge uh, the VC, very youthful VC. When we were at university, you could not be VC if you've not reached the age of 65. You had to be 65 before <laughs> you become VC. I want to acknowledge uh, Professor Fikeni, who is going to be the main presenter of the lecture. I further wish to acknowledge Professor Derkotze, who has done a lot of research on Moses Kotani, and also acknowledge Professor Kidiboni Paho, who will also be one of the discussants. I further wish to acknowledge my colleagues, the MECs that are here, and I uh, want to acknowledge our veterans. Mavusom uh, Simang, Zeke Stolo, my big brother Zeke Stolo, and uh, Paul Daphne. I also want to acknowledge Councillor Mampe and Councillor Monzane. I want to acknowledge two secretaries of COSATU, uh, this name uh, Soli is quite common in uh, politics today. <laughs> Soli Peter. <laughs> and the uh, Copano is your name, not Soli as well. This used to happen even in the ANC, where you had many Joes. You know, you'll have Joe Slovo, you know, you'll have uh, uh, Joe, who is the other Joe? Uh, John Tanta. Even Jacob Zuma was supposed to be a Joe. <laughs> Joe Moody say Joe. <laughs> I also want to say that all protocols observed. Program director, I'm not going to make a speech. Uh, before I was appointed to this position, I had a serious aversion for speeches. I was always uh, saying this to politicians when they speak. Now I see I've been uh, afflicted by the same disease. But I always try to go back to my uh, previous uh, uh, role as somebody would always say to politicians, please, please. My task here today is quite simple. I'm going to focus on three issues. One, to explain why we are supporting these foundations. 
established in honor of struggle stalwarts from our province. As part of our contribution to struggle legacy and liberation heritage. Two, to highlight why we are having this lecture and what do we intend to do from here onwards. Three, make uh, the VCD refer to this, but make a few points about our envisaged collaboration with the University of the Northwest. I used to get very envious and sometimes even jealous when I met uh, people, or should I say comrades from the Eastern Cape. We used to refer to that uh, province as home of the legends. They would uh, smugly and in an arrogant way assert that that province has produced more struggle legends than any other province. So I used to get a little bit jealous and say, hey, what happened to our province? And when they uh, speak about the uh, province being home of the struggle legends, I mean, I know you already know the names they would be mentioning in such a conversation, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Governor Mbeki, and others. This uh, resulted in me conducting a quick investigation to just say in the Northwest, don't we have people of that caliber, uh, which is a, a positive comparison, positive competition with the Eastern Cape. Then uh, my investigation uh, results excited me. And I was elated that uh, there were names that uh, came up. Uh, names like uh, Moses Kotani, uh, J.B. Max, Edwin Mufutsanyani, Joe Simpama, Joe Morolong, Victor Sephora, Philemon Matole, Ruth Mumpati, Rita Nzanga, and the list is really long. And sometimes I would get, uh, I would go to Pachevstrom to address a meeting. And uh, after this discovery, and I read a little bit on each of some of these individuals who are not that well known. And I would go to Pachevstrom and say to people in Pachevstrom, do you know Josim Palmer? And not a single one of them would say, yes, we do. And I would get a little bit. And uh, I would go to Rustenberg and say, do you know Victor Sephora? You know, from a crowd of about uh, 50, you just three hands, you know, and say, ah. And so I decided that since these people are not spoken about, since very little is written about some of them, we must start this initiative. The initiative to work closely with the families and where foundations have been established to work with the foundations to promote the legacy of these individuals and to really promote this legacy as part of our national heritage. And so we started giving support to the foundations we work very closely with uh, the Moses Kotani Foundation. We work very closely with uh, the Onkoputse Tiro Foundation. We work very closely with the Ruth Mumpati Foundation. We are still trying to structure some relationship with the J.B. Marx Foundation. We have also decided that will start uh, identify, identifying families of some of those struggle stalwarts who have departed. And so we have a relationship with the Victor Sephora Foundation. No, Victor Sephora family. They have not yet established a foundation. And uh, we have a relationship with uh, the family of Rita Nzanga. 
maybe I'm committing the same error again, not to say a little bit about some of these people who are they. Uh, uh, many of you here, stalwarts, will know them. But, uh, you know, for us, uh, uh, Edwin Mufutsenyan has spent uh, a lot of time here in this district. Uh, the husband to Tumpama and uh, a leading member of the Communist Party. And uh, in this district, we say very little about him. Uh, unlike uh, Malome Kotane, I've never heard people here in this region or in this province because we are all complicit saying anything about Edwin Mufutsenyan. Somebody was telling me that uh, uh, he's from Lesotho, uh, but we know that these boundaries here are artificial. Uh, but people from Lesotho are part of us. We are one people. That is why he found himself here in, uh, in this district. Uh, Joe Morolong, a leading member of the ANC, born somewhere near Freiburg in Dizipen, uh, who ended up uh, in the prison trial, who was, like all others, acquitted, who was a very close friend of uh, Helen Joseph. Together with Helen Joseph, they defied their banning orders and they were moving from province to province to support those who were banned but who could not move around like them, bringing them food, bring them clothing, and so on. And that David Tassifora, a very close friend, very close friend of Oliver Tambo, found a member of the ANC Youth League, you know, uh, Philemon Matole, another leading member of the Communist Party coming from Rustenburg. Uh, Ruth Mumpati, at least, I think the majority of us know the story of Ruth Mumpati. Rita Nzanga, because sometimes people say Rita Nzanga, and uh, we had a discussion, I don't know, uh, program director was it in Exco when we talked about Rita Nzanga and uh, there was a discussion that uh, people from Gauteng will look after her legacy and so on. I said but Rita Nzanga comes from Pochovstrom. Rita Nzanga is Rita Mori from a village near Pochovstrom. She was there and she was in detention with her husband in the 70s and her husband died in detention and uh, she was refused permission to attend the funeral of her husband. I'm just giving this uh, brief uh, biography, very brief biographies, Moses Kotan and J.B. Marx, you know. But let me go back to uh, the lecture why we are having this lecture. We are having this lecture here today because we believe Moses Kotani and uh, we were excited and uh, happy that the Communist Party named this uh, province after Moses Kotani. But we, del we believe that Moses Kotani is not accorded the standing he deserves, the respect he deserves. He played a role, very few played in the liberation of South Africa. We actually regard him, regard him as first among equals, Moses Kotani. We are bringing back Moses Kotani to where he belongs, joining the Communist Party, joining those who returned his remains to Tampostat. 
and say that uh, we want to take his uh, theoretical postulates, his political arguments, and implant them in the university. Like I said, Moses Kotane was a theoretician. Some initially, even in the party, did not agree with him. Some even went to the extent of demonizing him. But in the end, they uh, eulogized him, they embraced him, and proclaimed him as a leader of the world working class. And so his ideas warrant regular, regular investigation, regular research. We may, if you go back to his ideas, discover that uh, solutions that prove so elusive to take us out of this rut, this political rut we find ourselves in. We may find answers in his ideas. We also think that we want to bring Moses Kotani here. And we think that will make a profound contribution to social cohesion and transformation of the university. I was just trying to create this imagery in my mind. Moses Kotani sitting alongside those who were associated with this university, who were proponents of African nationalism, that if I close my eyes and I see them, and I see Moses Kotani there, that will uh, contribute towards us listening to one another. Because I strongly believe that we all have a story to tell. And it's only on the basis of listening to one another that we will understand each other and we will start developing a common vision, start developing a common consciousness. And a common vision and a common consciousness may be what is required now. That some of the ideas that uh, we had in the past, we have to reformulate them. We have to look at them anew. Even those that we rejected. It's quite interesting when I'm uh, with young Afrikaners and uh, I speak about Jopi Fori. And I ask them, what is the difference between Jopi Fori and Solomon Matlangu? Of course, the story of Jopi Fori changes all the time. Some say he was executed, some say he was assassinated. But if you are a young Afrikaner and you don't know the story of your Fori, it's a problem. Because during those times of the conflict between the British and the Afrikaners, Jopi Fori emerged as a hero. Now I ask the young Afrikaners, what is the difference between him and Solomon Matlangu? And it's only when we engage, starting to accommodate our fears, our hopes, that we'll find a way of developing this new vision, this new consciousness. We, as uh, the Northwest Provincial Government and the Moses Kotani Foundation and the university, are determined that this lecture is going to be our flagship lecture. We intend inv inviting thought leaders from inside the country, 
from the diaspora and from the south, uh, particularly from Latin America, where communities and nations there are involved in a very significant experiment to say, what is the alternative to this system that exploits, dehumanizes, impoverishes people? Whether it is Venezuela, whether it was Brazil, they are engaged in that very important struggle. And we have to share ideas with them. And so we think that we want to do that. Every year, invite a thought leader to come and address us here. And uh, look more now, less at characterizing the problem, but more at advancing some solutions. What are the solutions to our problems? And we are quite happy that today we have uh, luminaries like Somadada Fikeni, Der Kotze, and Professor Paho, who are going to share their ideas with us and say, this is what we think will take us out of this situation where there is no light at the end of the tunnel, where there is just darkness. We want to give our people hope. That is why we have to talk about a new vision and a new consciousness. Because in today's world, if we don't talk about poverty and alleviation of poverty, then we're engaging in a conversation, in debates and arguments that will not resolve our problems we have to address the issue of poverty. Poverty is linked to many other factors that are troubling our society. Whether it's unemployment, whether it's gender-based violence, whether it's the spread of HIV and AIDS, poverty is the key thing to deal with so that we address these other many problems. So we need a new vision. We need a new consciousness to say, what are we doing about this poverty? And we want people who come to our lecture to help us. Uh, today we are proud, we say, uh, one of uh, the products of uh, the 1990 for dispensation, it's uh, the, uh, the birth of uh, a middle class in South Africa. That the 1994 dispensation produced a large middle class in South Africa. But the large middle class is complaining. Uh, there's a word that uh, uh, the program director used to refer to them, that they are in the middle. They don't qualify for an RDP. They don't qualify for a bonded house. Where do they go? But we're saying we produced a significant number of middle class because of the 1994 dispensation. But inequality in South Africa is horrifying. And whenever sometimes we speak, and we want these issues to be addressed, not to skirt around them, we talk about somebody to make a sacrifice. And I know I don't want to talk too much about that with the secretary of uh, COSATU in the house. Somebody must make a sacrifice. But we often do not start there at the top. The very wealthy and the upper middle class can they make a sacrifice to ensure that we deal with this problem of poverty? So we will invite them to come here and speak about this. 
the final reason why we think we want to have uh, this uh, memorial lecture is that uh, we want the younger generation to appreciate what we say in Setswana. There's a new attitude to uh, even say that uh, those who were there, they sold us out at the World Trade Center, and we, that was a sellout deal. We are quite conscious, we old people, that uh, we may not have achieved what we intended to achieve, but some progress has been attained. And there, it doesn't make sense to say that uh, this dispensation was a sellout deal. And we do acknowledge the time is ripe for the change of the guards, for the change of leadership, for a younger generation to take over. But we think that the younger generation will be guided by people like Moses Kotani. We wish that they must familiarize themselves with his ideas. Uh, this uh, is a quotation that I'm sure many of us know from Yusuf Dad when he said that uh, Moses Kotane was incorruptible, not only in his political life, but also in his personal life. These are some of the values, and these values will transcend generations. You can't say, no, incorruptible belongs to the earlier generation. No, 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 no. Because then we will have problems of resources of this country being used for personal interest. And so we want to say to the youth, imbibe, espouse the values of Kotani. Whilst you bring about change, whilst you look at this new vision and this new consciousness. And that is why we are going to have this lecture. We are thrilled that uh, the university has agreed to write uh, the biography of Victor Sephora. Uh, there are people, I'm sure, in this hall who uh, met uh, Victor Sephora and uh, like uh, Zeke Stoll or like, uh, like uh, Jerry Machila, a firebrand. Even at the age of uh, 70, he was still thinking like a member of the ANC Youth League. So the university has agreed is going to write the biography of Victor Sephora, is going to write the biography of Rita Nzanga. But we think that uh, the lecture is just an announcement that we are going to build a relationship with the university to ensure that we keep this name of this internationalist alive. We have dreams that maybe one day when you come to this university, you'll go and do your research in the Moses Kotane Library, where his writings will be stored, and those of other, other stalwarts and legends. So that at this university, you will not only research about uh, Afrikaner nationalism, but you'll also research about uh, the contribution people like uh, Moses Kotani made to the struggle. There are numerous opportunities for collaboration with the university, 
I was just speaking to uh, Professor Peho, and he indicated to me that, uh, yeah, we could even have a, a Moses Kotani training program to produce the type of the caliber of leaders we need for this, uh, uh, for solving these difficult problems, socio-economic problems that confront our society. So there are many opportunities, and uh, we as government have appointed our own uh, Professor Job Mokoro to liaise with the university, to look at opportunities for collaboration. And uh, we are happy, we are happy that uh, he comes from this university, like Paul Daphne, and they belong to this university during difficult times. Uh, and the, the VC was there during difficult times uh, when uh, Mangope's uh, violence was visited on people on campus. It didn't uh, matter whether you were a lecturer or a, or a student. But he has experienced Professor Job Mokoro, and he'll be our link with the university. I don't want to spoil your appetite for what you are anticipating, and uh, I want to stop here and say we are very pleased, very excited that we are going to bring Moses Kotani back home. We are joining the Communist Party that has brought him home by name this province, Moses Kotani. We are joining those who brought his remains back to Tampostat. We want Moses Kotani to live amongst us until the end of time. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Premier Comrade uh, Bushimape. In fact, for real, we had a joint alliance decision for the first time provincially. And I know Comrade Dakota is here, Dakota Lihuete. By that time, he was provincial secretary. And Comrade Cabello is here, Comrade Copano is here. Our resolution was that the province, the provincial boundary in the constitution, must be changed to Moses Kotani. Now, LGP is there. She's the one who helped us to count numbers. It's a national assembly. That if you want a province changed, you, sub, you decide in a legislature submit to national assembly. And by that time, we we're below two-third majority. We did take a decision in the Northwest Provincial Legislature that the province must be changed. But the problem is because we could not make up numbers to the National Assembly for two-third majority. The ANC chickened out and remained ANC Northwest because we had already taken a decision in the Congress as the SACP. We remained ANC, SACP Moses Kotani. It was a Congress, National Congress resolution both us and KZN. KZN is called SACP Moses Mabida. Northwest is called uh, SACP Moses Kotane. Thank you very much. We're recognizing that Jose Mabalane, the deputy chair, has joined us. And I think that I must just acknowledge the ones I was told. Now I'm a boy of a rural area. So I'm not part of those who dreams of being horses, yet they have no royal blood. So Josima Utwe is here, I'm told. Josima Balane is here, and I can't say they must stand. Zwana Libana Bari Pula, yet they have no royal attachment. And Pula does not reign when it's not a royal blood that calls Pula. So I can't say Pula Bahaitu because someone must say it for it to rain, not me. Hosimu Tibi, I'm told Uteng, Hosikasibone, the one who went to Russia 
to fetch uh, the bones of Moses Godani is also here. So let's proceed. I'm now going to call uh, the former acting premier. <laughs> the former acting premier, uh, the current LGB, and the current MEC for finance in the province. Comrade Mutlale Pula. Mutlale Pula can bring it here. Kalina Hela. Isingbukhus. Uno Usis Nobantu. Hosho. To introduce the guest speaker. After the guest speaker, the difference between a praise singer of the book and that of natural praise singer is that a praise singer of the book must be called to the stage, but a natural praise singer knows when to come to the stage. Over to you, Comrade Hosho. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, facilitator. Uh, the way you introduced me, you are making it quite difficult. Uh, I can see you are trying very hard to make me to reconsider my budget adjustment <laughs> uh, for Tuesday. Nonetheless, uh, Exco has already adopted it, Honorable Premier. Let me take this time to acknowledge uh, the head of government, Honorable Premier, uh, Remape my colleagues in the Executive uh, Council, advisors in the Office of the Premier, our veterans, uh, I've seen Dr. Msimang, Uncle Zeik Stolo, the Alliance uh, Partnership, and I've seen the General Secretary of, uh, of Kosatu, Bukhosi Jwaruna, uh, Ryukoko Bedize, all the academics in their own rights, students, young women from the African National Congress Youth League, the ANC Women's League, Business Forum, councillors, I know I've seen a number of councillors, MMCs from the district and also within uh, Matosani. I've seen the one for, from JB Max. All activists, and I must also acknowledge because I'm a member of the Tlokwe Activist uh, Forum of the young people, some of the leaders and veterans from Tlokwe are here. And uh, the panelists, Prof. Chobeka, let's appreciate your, uh, your welcome but also acknowledge because I'm also a student in the University of African campus. I have committed uh, to prove that I will finish next year. I'll try very hard to finish next year. But let me acknowledge everybody and say all, obs all protocol observed. My task, colleagues, is to introduce the guest speaker, a political educator in his uh, own right, a community developer, an internationalist, an author, an advocate of social uh, transformation, and I must indicate uh, a program uh, director. I'm, I've tried to, as a student, to abridge uh, the profile of our guest speaker, which is quite long, uh, Prof. Chowek. I know that you'll take me to task as a student. Nonetheless, I'll try my best to run through uh, highlights of his contribution in our transformation of our country and the value that he has added in the body of knowledge in the country in making sure that uh, development in our communities becomes a reality, of course, with all its social ills and challenges, but of course, he also a, a, a mentor. He was born in uh, Mount Alif and Matresibeni, uh, and hails from a uh, Lugelweni village in the Afri Al Alfred Nzo district uh, municipality in the Eastern Cape. He has acquired uh, his B.A. and honors in politics and social sciences from the University of Transkei, that is currently known as Walter Sisulu University, and has studied peace and political studies program at Mac Mastam University in Canada and obtained his MA international, in International Politics and Comparative Development at Queen's University. And he also 
went to obtain his doctoral studies or PhD in comparative politics and public policy analysis at Michigan State University in the USA. Of course, he is an, a professor, but also he is one of our anchors for good governance in promoting ethical leadership, in promoting disciplines of good governance, is in advocating for service delivery and change in the lives of our people. He is the chairperson of the Public Service Commission in South Africa. And in this role, he is involved in national efforts to build a capable, ethical, and developmental state. He is involved in the professionalization of the public administration in South Africa, as well as the national dialogues that are aimed at forging a national uh, compact in changing the lives of our communities out there. His areas of expertise and policy analysis, comparative politics, research methodology, international politics, political economy, and heritage. So he, he has a, a vast uh, history and body of knowledge, and it's a source of many of us that we must draw courage from in advancing the agenda of the National Democratic Revolution. He's an author, researcher, public speaker, and commentator on a range of local and global political and social, social and heritage as well as economic issues. He received, of course, the most votes for the best political analyst in, in an SAFM organized program hosted by highly respected media personality, Ashraf Gara. This recognition was repeated again in 2017 when he was voted the best political analyst in a much publicized program uh, that solicited public voting and opinion. He is one of the most recognized figures among South African and African political and social commentators widely used by local, national, continental, and global media, uh, which is a number of our radio station uh, internationally. Hence, I say that he's an internationalist. He now dedicates more time identifying young talent as a mentor. He's, in, he's mentoring and, intro and introducing this to the mainstream media. Professionally, he, 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 has a lecture, he has lectured in a number of universities in South Africa. And we know that uh, he has also worked as a researcher at the Namibia Institute of Social uh, Economic uh, uh, Research. He held various management and leadership positions, which include being the major, the, the major manager of the University of uh, Transke. I've indicated that he's one of uh, our advocates who have uh, advanced the transformation of our country since the dawn of, of democracy. He has chaired the national, uh, national, provincial, and local boards, councils, task teams, projects, institutions, uh, namely your uh, your Walter Sisulu University Council, Eastern Cape Development Corporation, South African Heritage Resource Agency, South African Forestry Company Limited, and the Eminent Persons Group of, for Sports Transformation, Independent Development Trust, and Art Space. He was the member of the BRICS Think Tank. He was a member of the inaugural South African Council of International Relations until 2018. He has also been uh, appointed to serve in numerous national and inter international task teams and commissions of inquiry, including being in the United Nations Election Observer in East Timor, Southeast Asia, uh, during uh, 2007. So he has, uh, Mammoth, uh, he has uh, managed to work internationally in ensure that uh, issues of uh, free and fair elections becomes a reality within our communities out there. In 2014, December 2020, he was a director of VC Special Projects and an advisor to the VC, to the VC or principal of the University of South Africa, the largest African university and one of a few mega universities in, universities in the world. He's the founder and chairperson and of the Inlumati South African Scenarios 2030 projects, whose key findings and, and results have been, have, have been now been adopted by the public and private sector institutions. And it is 
and it is one of key reference points for government efforts to develop a social compact. He has been invited to speak on the occasions of the official funerals of uh, our Mpondo King, Mpondo, Mpondo Mbini Sklau, and Kosa King, Zuele Zonke Sklau. A student leader in his own right, and was involved in the anti-apartheid political struggle, and has been at, 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 at detained um, many times. He was involved with the Canadian anti-apartheid movement while studying at McMaster and Queen's University. He has extended his activism, albeit in a new form of community development initiatives, especially in the poverty-stricken rural areas. He has been involved in various community development projects, like I've indicated, that is a community a developer and uh, also a, a mentor. Currently, his major, major vehicle, vehicle project is the Ubuntu Charity Organization, through which he mobilized and uh, distributed resources for the poor, mainly rural communities in the east, eastern part of the Eastern Cape. He, he is also a founder member and president of the, of the Trebesilek Heritage Association of Southern Africa that seeks to promote, preserve, and protect Trebesilek he, uh, heritage and history. He was recently, in 2020, elected as the president of the Michigan State University Africa Alumni Association. He has passion for community work, for technology and innovation, for photography and nature, for agriculture and farming, as well as traveling that expose him to new places, uh, exotic cultures and, and people. And his uh, motto, by the way, is uh, living your dream no matter what the, circum the circumstance you may be placed in. Allow me, uh, Honorable MEC, my colleague, uh, to welcome Professor Somadota Fikeni. Prof. Welcome. Uh, program Director. I told that Imbongi must not be expected to be called. <laughs> Imbongi, please come. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor. Imbongi, please come. And you must also remember who Professor Inkos. Ndingashiwa. Kosea makasibe. Imbongi, please come. What kind of an Imbongi is this? That must be pleaded. Please come, Imbongi. Is these ones who go to school to be born? Selfless humankind, they make history. Their names are written on the walls, billboards, and street poles. Towns are named after them, and they still make part of syllabus in school. If the poem was about me, <laughs> I would say, Nisindi Balena. These are beings just like you and I. They tirelessly strive for perfection. They are brave through the human rights of work and the courageous. Amakawe ebeko nangala kuisileyo gotano nemfani. Bano velano bebenga sose ba miyeko miyenge nanda woyo kufisi koko. 
they would stand whatever difficulty. Recoils bring back into shape after birth. Powerful they are. Their strength cannot be compared. Can we learn a thing or two? Uh, program Director, MEC Sambata, the Premier of the province, with your executive team, the Chairperson of the Moses Kotane Foundation, Ambassador Kotane, with your leadership, the Vice Chancellor, who is hosting us, who is a colleague and a brother, Professor Kyobega, Mahoshi, present in the event here, the veterans and the stalwarts of our liberation, the leadership of the SACP, COSATU, and all other formations present here, the youth formations, the students, lecturers present here, and community members. I've seen the clergy and leaders of faith communities. I greet you all this afternoon, Dumelang. Malweni, good afternoon. San Bonan, Abshen, Demasiari. I'll just highlight a few things which I hope will be the basis for reflection. I'm humbled indeed to be invited to give the inaugural annual Moses Kotane Memorial Lecture to memorialize a doyen, a giant of our liberation heritage with such a rich history behind and impact he left behind. I just want to start by saying when a child is born and parents look for a name to give to that child very often, they are trying to imprint their collective vision, wish and hope around that child. the name itself become a vision statement. I can imagine that the Kotane family, when they said he would be Moses, especially at the time when many Africans had converted to Christianity, they were very much aware of the story of Moses in the biblical context. Indeed, as I was thinking of this name, I remembered the comments of Reverend Finga when he delivered the Diosoga Memorial Lecture when he said, looking at where we are as South Africa, we are in a time between times. We are in a place between places. The same way that the biblical Moses at a certain stage was. 
We are not where we were in 1994, but surely we are not where we intended to be. We started so well, and progress was tangible, and the moment was pregnant with possibilities. But everyone, and everywhere one can tell that we have taken a detour. We are on a highway. We were envied by the world. We had moved from being a pariah of the world into being a paragon of virtue. From Harvard to Oxford, from Cambridge to Princeton, from UCT to Northwest University, people were talking about this brave giant experiment of South African democracy. Even the homegrown political solution had become an example. Most South Africans were being called to Northern Ireland. They were being called to the Middle East on the Israeli-Palestinian challenges. They were being called around the world because we were a country alive with possibilities. And fast forward. Each day you read or listen to news, you would be mistaken for listening to crime report. Whether it's gender-based violence, femicide, or it's corruption. Whether it's the killing of a whistleblower or the kidnapping of a child. It is time like this that we must be brutally honest and ask ourselves, where did we go wrong? And what is most painful is that this country, if you travel around the world, has the greatest potential to be great. It has all what it takes to be great. But for some reason, many of those in leadership positions have embarked on suicidal missions possessed by spirits that are difficult to understand. where national interest is subsumed as part of personal interest, where the utterance of revolution, transformation, and all other trappings that used to be in the liberation, nomenclature, and grammar have lost meaning. What went wrong? Indeed, when Moses is said to have led his people out of bondage, theologians and biblical scholars said they could have taken eight days to walk to the promised land. But they took a detour that would take them 40 years. And whilst in this time between times, in this place between places, they turned against each other. They spent most of the time fighting against each other 
and some even started wondering if it was not better under the pharaohs. Some started wondering if this promise of God to get to the promised land was not a fiction and they started creating their own gods. And we in that space. Where most warehouses which used to have economic activities have closed down only to become spaces for prosperity gospels. Where we saw along the way the closing of agricultural colleges, teaching colleges, nursing colleges, police colleges, so it was the best of times, and yet it was the worst of times. When we step back to reflect, we might be tempted to invoke those words of the tale of two cities. If ever there is a chance for us to talk about renewal, reconstruction, rebuilding, we must be clear and clinical and we must be honest about what the challenge is because proper diagnosis will lead to proper prescription. You'll remember that intellectual giants like Moses Kotane were wrestling with Marxism, communism, which was tailored for the European conditions when they were raising discourse around the national question, around the natives within the context of historical materialism. They were wrestling with these specific conditions when they came up with the notion of apartheid as being colonialism of a special kind. They didn't mimic the literature that existed. They went for original ideas, helped to develop concepts and theories around our own conditions. Most leaders like Moses Kodane, we have more or less forgotten them. We have more or less forgotten what they stood for. They are no longer trendy. But there comes a time when we face a crisis and we have to go back to basics. What then is that missing link that we are faced with? Before I go to the missing link, at the dawn of our democracy, we surrendered our agency because we thought leaders who have been around the world in exile seeing things and examples would never disappoint us. We thought that leaders who had been in prison could not have taken such a sacrifice only to betray the values of liberation. We thought that leaders who were in combat missions risking it all would never betray the values. We thought that South Africa, being one of the last to obtain its independence, have learned what not to do. Were we not so wrong?
with time like a frog in boiling water, we didn't notice the shifting grounds. When Madiba in this province in 1997 warned of the changing character of the ANC Kada drifting away from the central values, we sort of dismissed him as an old man who might have lost touch with reality, who should give space to others. When other leaders like Bishop Tutu and many others raise the issue around the erosion of values, we dismissed those warnings. But now we are reaping the fruits of ignoring those warnings. What makes a Moses Kotane, the Albert Lutulis, the Tambos, the Mandelas, the Dubes, the Sol is so different from the leaders of today? What makes the Lilian Goyes, the Winnie Madigizela Mandelas, the Charlotte Matlagas of yesterday to be so different from the leaders of today? What makes the Sobukwes, the Steve Bigos, the Tiros to be so different? I went back looking at the biographies of these leaders. They were organic. They were grounded within the communities. They were fully involved in the lives of the communities. So they didn't need a petition or correspondence to understand what the problems were. Those were organic leaders embedded within the conditions of their times and their communities. Hence their articulation didn't even need speech writers. But today, a political leader on average is a career politician, full time. So that is the first level of alienation that you see very often even where we talk of community outreach, constituency service. It has a time limit where a leader comes in and say, guys, you'll have to push me to the front of the program because I have a flight to take very soon. So that is the first distinction. The second problem is how over time the eye of the needle either has widened or the needle has been stolen. which used to be a filter of who could be and not be a leader. Now even the articulations of liberation language have been captured, weaponized for the very opposite of what liberation was meant to be. So the greatest capture that happened before the state capture is the capturing of the narrative of liberation itself. 
Now it's been hollowed out. It no longer has meaning. It's used. And we wonder why sometimes during these political rallies, including what used to be a sacred period of January 8th, people go in when political speeches are made. They go shopping. When musicians and artists come to perform, they come back. What does that mean? The biggest problem is that it's no longer just the older generation, VC. You go to universities at a very young age, SRC leaders refining their skills for fine things in life and materialism, which means they are on internship for greater materialism later in life. Which means even our talk of generation mix should not be without condition of certain kinds of values and competencies. It should not just be young, but young with integrity and competence. Even when we say gender mix, it should be inclusion of the genders that have not been mainstreamed, but quality being the condition. Because you can't use demographic profile to reproduce corruption or incompetence. <clears throat> At the height of fees must fall, the roads must fall, 2015, 2016, I was asked to meet with the leaders of SRCs. I was asked to meet with the leaders of SRCs across universities. And I asked them one question. I hear you very well and I understand and sympathize with you that indeed roads must fall, fees must fall. And I ask, have you spent enough time to conceptualize what must rise in the place of what must fall? Because in the life of any society and the struggle, there is a time when walls of Jericho should be brought down. But there comes a time when walls of Jerusalem should be built. But it looks like the era of destruction has reached an automated self-propulsion where you burn a library in order to get the road fixed. You burn the road in order to get electricity. But what happened at the heart of this detour? I've looked back in our history and realized that when masses of the people are given agency to be the masters of their destiny, the needle in our history has moved in the positive direction. Mass defiance campaigns in the 50s, where communities from all walks the cross-section of society participated from Amakosi to street committees, cultural groups, church groups participated. It 
was able to produce a freedom charter. That same generation was able to have PAC launched because agency was with the people, not with the leaders. You remember in the 20s when ANC was almost moribund. It's because people had retreated and leaders were content on taking on delegations, negotiating. Again, this repeats itself in the 70s when the black consciousness movement was mobilizing on the basis of self-reliance and that mental emancipation. Again, you see the quality of leaders that come out when the entire society is mobilized, is conscientized, is vigilant. It's better qualitatively than when leaders are left alone. Because it's beyond just the discussion of the eye of the needle by those who are in a branch which in all probability has just been propped up for a conference and will die thereafter. It's organic. People know who is a leader and who is not. People know who is there all the time. People know who is making sense. Again, in the 80s, mass democratic movement, sports groups, church groups, traditional leaders, everybody was mobilized. And no apartheid force could stop them. And look at the quality of how leadership emerged out of that. But leave the political class alone to decide in Congresses who should lead and not. You end up in a mess that we find ourselves in. Then, post-1990, I think people retreated because they were sure that leaders would do what they were supposed to do. NGOs lost their funding because now we had a democratic government that was to be guided by the Constitution. But what happened? Even in the most failed municipality, without any funding, with roads which are pothole, you know, punctuated, you'll find that the biggest building you find are the offices of the elite. Right across the country, it's more like they were competing to produce union buildings in every corner. The most overdeveloped thing in the municipalities and across other offices. Because now the elite, whether business or political or civil society, once unguided by a mobilized, conscientized, vigilant society, they prioritize themselves. You look across the world, what happens when you have elite coalitions or elite transitions? Then we wonder why we have become the most unequal society in the world. Such society community mobilization The grassroots mobilization has become so fundamental now, as was during the time of Moses Kotane, because it doesn't matter what numbers of police you add, they can't fight off crime. They can't defeat corruption. 
But if the community is vigilant, what the state does will complement that. But one big question is, how do we unlearn the wrong things that we have learned? Because on average you find that some people may know that there are certain ethical values to be followed. A person can deliver a moving lecture about those values only to find that in the waiting room there is somebody who is ready to sit down and commit corruption with because they are aware of these values cognitively but they have not internalized them. And it is for that reason that in the Public Service Commission I've been meeting together with my commissioners with people like the leader of the moral regeneration, Father Smangal Somkachwa, director of uh, Ethics Institute, to ask a simple question. How do we make people unlearn the wrong things that they have now learned to relearn the new values and the ethos. How in the era of moral regeneration we went into the space of moral degeneration. It is for that reason that I've had meetings with Professor Ngulu to say even the audit firms that ought to assist in the auditing had become enablers of corruption. And this kind of corruption doesn't care whether it's a public or private sector, from staying off to all kinds of state captures in the departments. Because as Samuel Johnson says, chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. What is to be done? I'll just list a few things and sit down which I think could take us on a journey towards the highway we were in. The first one there is a desperate need for a national dialogue so that we can have consensus on what the problem is, more importantly, where do we want to go, that which will produce social compact. And such national dialogue should not be partisan or confined to a political party because we have seen the toxicity of political parties and their internal dynamics. And for those who think that is just the ruling party, look around. We no longer have a problem of the ANC. We have a problem of a political class. Because some show the same genetic traces of the mother body even when they walk away. Whatever repackaging they are making, you start seeing that in the way they walk, the way they talk, some paragraphs, which means the message was not the problem, but the messengers have become a problem. The messengers lack credibility. The messengers lack believability. Whatever they say no longer matters. 
if you say, I'm going to implement this policy, people say, ah, many have failed. Once you start having that credibility crisis, as the Afro barometer has shown, in government, in the political system, the people participating even in elections, the numbers have gone down. So that social compact should in many ways mirror what happened when we had CODESA, but before the second transition, which focuses on the areas that have failed dismally, the socioeconomic transformation. We have succeeded in creating institutions of democracy. They are there. Our constitution is heralded as one of the best and progressive. Our governance systems, our financial systems, but the biggest mistake we made, we invested on systems and on things that are tangible, such as the infrastructure, and we forgot to invest on human consciousness. We have the highways now, except that the highway heist is there. It's because we maximize the minimum and minimize the maximum. At times, we were even intimating on reducing all those philosophy, social sciences, which help with the critical thinking. Because science had to be something. But science without social context could be dangerous. Imagine if those scientists who were designing atomic bombs had the critical consciousness of what their actions could be than just being scientists. We have climate change challenges. Scientists of today must be socially conscious. It's where the role of the universities come in. So a new person should be born with a new consciousness, with a new personality, so that our society can have a moral code, our public service can have an ethos, our political leadership can have some value proposition and guide. But one other casualty of this transition is the death of the African family. It collapsed. It's not featuring in any of our discourse. And yet, a solid family with solid values provides social security. And it's a primary socializing agent. When a family collapses, community must collapse and society will collapse. Underestimate the role of a family at your own peril. Those families were able to cater and look for people who were destitute wherein we didn't have child-headed family. Even when there was no Sasa before because an African family had Ubuntu. It strived not to build a house, but to build a home with a certain kind of orientation and attitude. So the role of knowledge institutions and socializing agents like family, like schools, imagine if in life orientation we were to focus on the issue of ethics, on the issue of Ubuntu, on the issue of values, to which says, I am because we are. It would present a new proposition rather than the disparate Google-extracted homeworks for life orientation, 
which have no focus, no direction. Because our crisis is a moral crisis. But our education is focusing in every other direction except there. Our media can also play a role. But in the midst of all these things, I want to close by saying, yes, we are a noisy, argumentative, temperamental, headline-obsessed democracy, which sometimes has a short span memory of Twitter. We never focus on any issue and try to link what is happening. If this week it's Senzo Meiwa, it's Senzo Meiwa. If next week it's the debut of Soweto, that's what it's going to be. If that week is something else, it's something else. If it is Palapala, pala, it will be Palapala, pala, as one is saying here. But those things, we never actually go deeper as Moses Cortanez would do and say, what are the causal factors? What is the link between these incidents? Why are they recurring? Some work is taking place and it will need your support. One of those is professionalization of public service. If you produce professional, meritocratic, ethical public service, it becomes a shock absorber for the political tragic comedy playing itself out. That's why in Britain you could have three prime ministers but services continued because you have that layer. That's why in Belgium they went on for 540 something days without any government, but services continued. Because you have delinked your public service to become the institution of state that outlives the life of an administration. Whoever comes in, they continue to do their national duty. And they are technically competent for what they are doing. You don't find a person who is doing project management, but the qualification is anthropology. and hope that the results will come out fine. So I've come to say, for us to bring to life the spirit of Moses Kotane, we must begin to take that journey of change. But that journey of change will not come from a leader somewhere will not come from an instruction book somewhere, it will start with you. Because moral lapses come when you say, I'm waiting for regulations. Ethics, it's about you taking a stand on what is wrong or right. And I want to close by saying the biggest challenge of our country today that those who want to see recovery, renewal, and rebuilding are so fragmented, so tentative in their thinking, so disorganized, so mild, so meek. But those who are invested in the status quo, no matter how bad it might be, are so intense so vocal, so focused, so well organized that you'd start thinking they are speaking in the voices of millions. It is for that reason that in 1997, Madiba said, perhaps this country needs the RDP of the soul. 
because he realized that the RDP of housing, of electricity, the RDP of infrastructure, not complemented by the new consciousness would be hollow, non-sustainable, and meaningless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Go by in socialism. That's why, uh, Professor, I'm saying he needs socialism. He needs socialism. If we don't go to the system, we don't go to the system and keep chasing individuals who are elected and co-opted by the system, each one we put in the post would too be co-opted because we are running away from the system and too much focusing on individuals. That's why the color of poverty has not changed. Both color and gender has not changed. Predominantly is women, not only women, black women. Predominantly is youth, not only youth, black young people, dominantly. Because we are chasing individuals and not the system. And there are others we elect and we think that they can help us. And when co-opted by the system, we get shocked. Today, Professor and the distinguished team, you don't get elected if you don't have money. You don't get elected if you don't have money. We even buy space to be delegates. You don't get elected to be a delegate. You buy space to be a delegate. And the person you are going to vote for pay for you for the space to be a delegate. What, what outcomes are you expecting? Because first, people who have money are the ones who are contesting. Secondly, people who have money have managed to buy spaces for delegates. So the conference you're going to, its outcomes are predetermined by those who have mind have even those that are still preoccupied with sealed envelopes, they know that in the commission, Sondo Commission, we were told by SAS, State Security, that money had to leave coffers of state security. 
And that money did not go to the sealed envelopes, but it went to the opposite side. So the contamination is more money. If I was having Zahara's song, put my voice, which says, Mani, Mani, Mbangye Sonu. Mali, Mali, Mbangye Sonu. Se sibula la nangenga yako. Zahara says, Nakum uzamile mali, kota upumele langa. Very few of us can say that. But nakum uzamile kota upumele langa. I'm told there's going to be performance after this very uh, wonderful uh, presentation. I like it because now I'm a beneficiary professor of your very clear articulations. When people don't see you, when they see me, they think I'm so much daughter. <laughs> Majority of people say, so much daughter, somebody. Did you know, I'm not so much daughter, I'm my daughter, so my daughter is Fikeni. So whenever you hear him, it's not me. But I like it because I'm a beneficiary of everything that you say. Thank you very much. Uh, can we give Professor a round of applause? <laughs> I, like, I like it because he's a horse, if you don't know. Am I classed? Now, am I classed again? are following twins. What I like about him is that he's almost closer to Northwest traditional leaders. If you don't know fact, is that majority of Northwest traditional leaders have gone to school. Majority of them, they've gone to school. They're not just born to lead. They've also gone to see that Big institution with many windows called school. <laughs> They've gone to that. I like that. And I like that he also is a traditional leader. You don't have to be a traditional leader only by birth. Also development has to be one of the issues we do. Thank you very much. Uh, can you give him a round of applause? And then performers must come. Performers, please come. All I hear is my heartbeat beating like 
heart to drum, beating with confusion. All I hear are the voices telling me to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am told you must not have hunger panic. Because the coordinators of the lecture have provided, but because of the rules, Food is not allowed inside a chamber because here there are also council speakers. I don't want to break those rules that even municipalities practice. The institution practice the same. No food is allowed inside the chamber, so don't hunger, uh, panic. We now are going to, I had seen Amy Simuilwa when I came in here, but I've not yet when she was introduced. We do Melo, Muilwa MEC for Social Development. I had seen her originally. To me, where are you? Okay, she's here. And any other one uh, of leadership uh, in any sector who has joined us later. I don't want people to say, I knew he hates me. In any case, he was not going to introduce me. That's one of the problems we have in our province, of people who lead with hatred. You go to a conference, contest, you are an enemy of the person you were nominated against. Immediately that person gets elected, you are the first target. You must run for life. If you were deployed huh, after a conference, and this thing started in 2005, many people don't believe it. Started in 2005 in the Ben Mare conference in Rustenburg. So I have 26 years in Northwest contestation. 
So anyone who wishes me to be from Eastern Cape is wishing for something that does not exist. 26 years, Northwest Contestation, 2005, it started there. When people won, two things they said. One, one delegate from KK stood up and said they must feel like we are in power. The second one from Ngaka says, free at last. That was an ANC conference. And by that time, it started. We're now going to that most critical time, yeah? Response from panelists. The first one is a general secretary of the SACP was he linked. Okay. Hatu, I must go to the second one. Hatu. I must go to the second one. Professor Dirk Kutse, who's political analyst and senior political lecturer in UNISA, is the second one. On the respondent, Professor. Um. Mr. Program Director, uh, Mr. Premier, and the other guests, as well as colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm not going to speak long. It's becoming a long afternoon now. But my task is to talk about the political prospects for South Africa in the journey towards recovery and re rebuilding. But to start with, who of you have seen this book before? This is the only, so far as I know, biography of Moses Kutani that exists. I hope the, Depart the University Library does have some copies of this, because this is, I guess, the starting point. If we talk about a, a memorial lecture or a project built around Moses Kutani, then we need to know who he is as a person and who he was and what was the role that he played. I think in order to link it to what I want to talk about, let's go back to the time when he became involved in the, South, in the Communist Party of South Africa. Note that the party between, before 1953 was called the Communist Party of South Africa. After 1953, when it was revived, it became the South African Communist Party. So he was part and became the General Secretary of the Communist Party of South Africa in 1939, and he joined in the early 1930s. Now, what was the situation in the 1930s when he joined the Communist Party? It was that of where the ANC is basically today, that of factions, of infighting, of not knowing who is actually in charge of and who are the dominant sort of persons in positions within the ANC. Because there was ideological infighting, there was ideological dis disunity within the ANC about many things. In this booklet, you will see that he worked with a person called Leiser Bach. Leiser Bach was sent into exile by the Communist Party themselves to the Soviet Union. And he died there ultimately because of the incoherence, the disunity that exists within the Communist Party. The Communist Party decided during this time, because of these problems, to move their headquarters from Cape Town to Johannesburg. So the, the problems, political problems that we are talking about today is not necessarily or are not necessarily new. And this was the situation that Moses Kutani confronted because then in 1939, about five years later, he became the leader of the Communist Party, the General Secretary, until 1978, for 39 years, the longest serving General Secretary of the Communist Party. And at that stage, the Communist Party was not the Communist Party that we are familiar with. The Communist Party, of when it was formed 101 years ago, Last year, the Communist Party was 100 years old. And I have to say, 
I don't think the Communist Party last year celebrated it. Can you talk, refer to anything which happened except the book published by Tom Lodge, who's not a member of the Communist Party, about the history of the Communist Party? So I think there, there are a lot of context that one has to take into account. When he became the General Secretary of the, of the Communist Party, it was also the beginning of the Second World War. And it was a crisis for the whole of the world, including South Africa. It affected the domestic politics, the, the domestic situation in South Africa also. So he became involved in the politics of his time at a time over and above the apartheid situation of internal disunity, of internal problems. And what he had to, did he have to do is to think out of the box in order to be able to introduce paradigm shifts. And I think, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, is to what extent can we explore paradigm shifts, specifically in the political domain? Because it's, I don't think there's going to be any use to say we must go back to a situation and we want to revive that situation. We are here at the universities, I'm an academic. We must think in terms of innovative ideas. We must think about new ideas. We must think about, in line with what confronted him, what is confronting us at the moment. So if we look at the, the specific focus that I must talk about, about the political prospects, I think that that refers in the first instance, and I'm going to follow a relatively narrow approach. There's many other things that can be included in this, but in order to have a discussion which is, I guess, hopefully meaningful, that I, I will look at it from a narrow point of view. And that is to look at what are the role of state institutions and political leaders within those state institutions. And what are, therefore, the prospects, the possibilities, the paradigm shifts that we can introduce? And how can we redefine public life Especially, therefore, because I'm saying, I'm talking about in political institutions, the executive, the government, as well as the legislature. I'm not going to talk about the judiciary. It's a little bit a different sort of perspective or different you know, approach that one can follow to that. Now, the executive, by implication, therefore, government. What we are seeing now is not any more what we are, have been used to in the past 25 years or more. It's not anymore a one party that is the dominant party in government, the ANC by implication. We are now moving towards coalition governments. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, um, and what we are supposed to see, the, the basis that we are looking for is governments, whether they are coalition governments or not, which are informed and motivated by sound policy, public or um, political policies. So I want to talk about this combination, the combination of institutions, and I know Professor Fiken um, already said we have good institutions in place, but how they can be partnered, linked, accompanied by policy, public policies also, and obviously the implementation of it. Now one thing, and I want to, to add on to him, or to respond to him, or to, to to give my sort of endorsement, well, not endorsement, my, my, my support for what he was saying, and that's about the leadership in public administration. Political leadership, and that means the public, el publicly elected politicians, the ministers, the MECs, the MMCs, they must demand in the first instance accountability about the performance from public officials. So if many people are saying, but these are our public representatives, they must become involved in the day-to-day -day governing process. What we are talking about, what he is referring to, and what I want to emphasize, is that there is a separation between the two. It's not that they overlap, or they should not overlap. The fact that they have become overlapped and that that overlap as, or that separate, that space between the two have become so blurred is part of our problem. Mm -hmm. Is because politicians become involved in the work of officials, of public administrators, of public officials. 
And because of that, it opens up all the possibilities for corruption and fraud and, and all, all sorts of other unethical types of, of conduct. Therefore, I would argue that where we stand as academics and as members of government is that, first of all, that relationship between public political leadership and the public officials must be revisited. It has become blurred. Now, that relationship is not at this stage clear for most people in, in, involved in those positions. And therefore, this new publicly announced um, framework for prof professionalization of the public sector is exceptionally important. I know there's a lot of criticism by some people about it. The implications are, for example, whether it, what is the meaning for cadre deployment, what is the meaning even for black economic empowerment. Those type of debates are there. But the principles underlying this, I think, is a new innovative element that's now being on the table and that we must have a very close look at, especially from a university point of view, from researchers, from academics, and from students. That has been echoed by the Zondo Commission. You know, if you go back to the, the, first, the first volume of the Zondo Commission, it talks about professionalization, specifically of the procurement uh, processes and those involved in procurement, because that's an absolutely key element, element of government, of the allocation of contracts, of the identifying who's providing services, and that's where the problems can happen. And if there's not professional persons involved who are guided by a professional codes of conduct, then we have the problems that we have at the, at the moment. So what we need is, in the first instance, and it will look, sound like very much like an absolute cliche for you, but effective and efficient government. And I think what we have to accept, from some it will be very important, uh, very difficult to accept that, but that's that we are actually going through another political transition. We had the political transition, the dem democratization process in 1994, but I think we are now, whether we are aware of it or not, but effectively we are going through another political transition. And that is away from a system of one dominant party to a, s a situation of coalition governments. And the notion of recovery or rebuilding, which is now key to our discussions of today, um, <clears throat> depends on parties which comprehend their tasks and responsibilities of what it means to be part of government. Yeah. That is the very essence. If we talk about a renewing process or a rebuilding process or a recovery process, then it means that we must understand very well what is the role of each and every one, the, the different roles in government. We must understand the separation of powers between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial authorities of the state. We must at the same time understand and make it very clear and enforce it what is the separation between political leaders in the executive and the officials in the public uh, sector or in the public administration. It is not necessarily correct to argue that coalition governments are per definition unstable or insufficient um, for the current situation. Coalition governments are not necessarily bad governments. Yeah. It can become, in, a, in an ideal situation, it can be, uh, coalition governments can become actually politically more inclusive than, part, than governments that consist of only one political party. And it can amount to a real form of power sharing you know, versus the winner-takes-all situation if only one party is in power. I don't try to pre present to you a situation that coalition governments are better than other governments. But, but I'm saying don't dismiss the, the direction in which this, the current situation is going and say, this is a new but a bad development. It's a development which is not taking us forward and it is not going to assist um, in terms of the, the way of finding a, a, a situation or a way out of the current situations. Coalitions can even create their own checks and balances. Take, for example, what is likely happening in Tswane. 
where there's the issue between the uh, Action SA and the DA, especially about the mayor. Right? So it's two components, two members of that particular coalition that are actually criticizing each other in all, because of some issues about um, ethical following of procedures. Now, one point which uh, Professor uh, Samaroda Fakeni emphasized a lot at the end of his presentation, which I want to, to emphasize also and to endorse and to add my, my support to that, is the new, although it should not be new, but the, the new emphasis that there should be on ethics in government. And I think you know, many of us who are even at universities, we are involved in that we must declare our income or our directorships, those who do have it, or for whom they are doing external work and so on. That's procedural matters. It is, and I don't think that is in the essence what ethics is about. It's not about clicking the boxes, ticking the boxes of what you have d disclosed as what you are busy with and doing. Ethics for me is about values. It's about morality, although it's not exactly the same. But it is about your, your attitude towards the, that what you are doing. And your attitude of saying, I'm, not, I'm going to do it for the best interest of those for whom it is supposed to be done. Not whether I have followed it procedurally or not. That is obviously important, but ethics don't stop there. It's much more than simply that you are not having a conflict of interest when you are in sitting in a meeting where some decisions are taken. Um, so uh, this is what, where I, what I would say what, it's my, what I want to focus on in terms of the recovery, rebuilding, rethinking, paradigm shifts that are supposed to be or can be considered when we look at government, the executive side, which is very important because that is where decisions are made about policy matters, about budgets, about spending, about contracts, all those sort of things. But I would argue equally important from a political point of view is the legislators, parliaments. In the past, we have become used this, to the symbiotic relationship between one government, governing party, with their members of parliament in parliament. And there was this symbiosis between the two. It's very difficult to distinguish between the two. Now that we have more and more coalition governments, that symbiosis that does not necessarily exist anymore. That means now that parliaments are not, in a sense, subsumed to the executive. If you have a situation like in the past where the governing party has a huge majority, then the members of parliament are not necessarily very important for that party because they are in control of the executive. And they won't rock the boat, if we can use that expression, for the executive. But once you have a situation where one party is not more anymore in control of government, it means there's more plurality, more diversity. And that means at the same, by implication, that parliament can stand on its own feet, can become more independent and can do its work more. Now, what can parliament do? And I think these, these few points that I'm going to address now are issues where parliament, as it is at the moment, is not necessarily, in my view, playing the role that they can play. First of all, Parliament approves the budget, whether it's a national budget or provincial budget or local budget. It's a hugely important decision that's taken by Parliament. Ideally speaking, Parliament should actually go into a process of negotiations with the executive about how that budget should, should look like. Because all the members of parliament, remember, are supposed to be public representatives. So they rep represent us, each one of us individually. So part of that representation process of responsibility is that they must also represent us in all respects about how the public money is going to be used. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, a very important point, which is, strictly speaking, not happening, whether at national or provincial or local level. Provincial oversight. 
This is one aspect which the Zondo Commission criticized in its report, that the current or the parliaments of the past haven't done that. And that is that the executive and the administration, the public administration, must become dependent on the approval of parliament for the work that they are doing. That they must account for what they are doing to parliament. And that is, though there's portfolio committees, there's section 179 committees in lo at local government, there's all sorts of committees, there's SCORPA and so on. Again, it, the formalities of it is sometimes not sufficient, it's not enough. And relationship between the executive and parliament will have to be established. It doesn't depend whether the Minister of Tourism has refused, although she was summoned, to go to parliament and now it's a crisis between her and parliament. That type of situation should not arise at all if there's a relationship between the two. Then a matter which is very much in the news at the moment, and that's the re reform of the electoral system, the introduction of independent candidates. Yes, it's very important, but I think it has to, it is the opening move, I would say, of looking at the electoral system in a broader sense, because ultimately that will have a direct impact on how parliament relates to us as the voters or as the general public and to the governing party also. And that links also to the funding of political parties, which as you can imagine is at the moment very much in the news. I'm not talking about Palo Palo only. <coughs> so what does it mean if we look at all of this together? It actually means that our concept of political parties as they are now for the past 20, 30 years will have to be revisited. You've possibly heard or seen of seen an Afrobarometer and other survey information that the, the public level of trust in political parties are very low. The same in, polit in politicians, the same in politics in general, and it's going down with lower voter turnout. At the moment, political parties are basically fo focused on elections. It is driven by their leadership. And I think what is necessary as a sort of a suggestion, remember I said in the beginning we must start to think about paradigm shifts, is that it must become social agents in society. What about a political party if it is, for example, not the governing party, that if you are a member of that party, you can have also access to a funeral plan of that party, that that party facilitates. That you are also linked to medical insurance through that party. That you are also, that that party has also a leadership training facilities. That young people can go there, go through a leadership training process, even if they don't become a leader in that party, but they understand a bit of financial management, they understand a little bit of organizational management, they understand how to write minutes, they understand how to chair meetings, those type of things, life skills. Skills that you can use in other contexts of your own life. But you've, you've, the party facilitated it. It's part of the package that you as a member receives. The fact that you can have even access to banking, ZCC, the church, and, and uh, Timey Bank, they have a relationship. So it means it's a completely different notion, concept of what political parties will be. It will start to make sense to become associated with it. And it's not just a vote during elections. Now to conclude, Moses Kutani, as I said in the beginning, I think what he did is he redefined politics of his time. And I want to refer to just one aspect, and that is that in 1934, he wrote what became known as the Craddock Letter. And in that letter, which it was addressed to the Johannesburg Party uh, co uh, Committee of the Communist Party, he bemoaned the fact that the Communist Party of then, and it was formed in 1921, was led and driven, and its ideology came from people who came from Europe, from Britain and the old Eastern European countries because of the mining industry, the mining that happens, especially here in the north, 
And those were mine workers who came to South Africa with the British tradition of trade unionism and so on, and they transplanted it onto the Communist Party of then. But he realized, and when he was in the Eastern Cape, that that is completely out of touch with the South African situation, that the Communist Party was focused on the class struggle, and the class struggle was not the main issue for the people in the rural areas of the Eastern Cape where he was during this time. There was in 1928 the common turn, the Communist International, that was in, met in Moscow. They adopted a resolution which is now generally referred to as the Native Republic Resolution, which I would say introduced in 1928 already the idea of a two-phased or two-stage theory of first a democracy and thereafter a socialist dispensation. The South African Communist Party was not very enthusiastic about this idea. It was a decision taken by the Comintern. But Moses Kontani realized that this addresses or addressed the situation in South Africa much better than the Communist Party of South Africa itself. So in 1939, when he became the uh, general sector of the Communist Party, um, and a little 20 years later, in 1963, and for 10 years became, when he became the Treasurer General of the, of the ANC at the same time, so he occupied two positions, that of the Communist Party's General Secretary, the de facto leader of the Communist Party, and the sec uh, Treasurer General of the ANC. Effectively, I would argue, actually pers he personified the, the coming together of the two organizations, the formation of the alliance between the two organizations, the bringing together of the, of the socialism of the ANC and the, uh, of, of the Communist Party and the nationalism of the ANC. Uh, of, of the ANC. And that led to the, uh, uh, um, the notion of 1915, late, later 1962, of, of um, colonialism of a special type. It led to, in the 1960s, to the idea of the two-stage theory of first the national democratic and then the socialist revolution. And thereby, he actually redefined South Africa's politics, or politics in, the, in relation to the ANC and to the, the Communist Party. So in conclusion, I would say there are very few politicians who can make a paradigm shift. He was one of them. And I think that is a paradigm shift is a requirement for our topic, which is about recovery and rebuilding. I actually want to reformulate it a little bit to say it's not only about recovery and rebuilding, but it is actually about imagination, innovation, and implementation. Thank you. doing a coup. Very silent one. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Professor. Uh, thank you very much. We are also joined by U Reza. Do you know Reza? The North, Northwest version of Blade. Comrade Silo uh, Lehari, MEC of Kosatma and the Provincial Treasurer of the ANC. We must also welcome Comrade Pisma Be, the PEC member of the ANC in Gauteng, who is the chair of the Gauteng chapter of Rebecca Kotana lecture consistently. Let's give a round of applause for Comrade Peace. There she is from Mukhale City. Comrade Peace. We're now going to take the next uh, respondent. Professor Kitibone Pango, Pango, yes. Northwest University Director for School of Governance, our school. Thank you very much. Round of applause to welcome Professor. We are already taking I was launching a coup here. <laughs> Program Director, uh, Vice Chancellor, Premier, uh, Chair of Moses Kotani Foundation. 
traditional leadership in this house. Um, the MECs that are here, my uh, DVCs, university management, the deans, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I'm going to try and be a bit short uh, in my response. Our conversation this afternoon is on the resetting of South Africa's journey towards uh, recovery and rebuilding. It is indeed humbling for me to be part of this auspicious event to honor our legendary and our doyen, uh, Moses Kotani, with this pertinent theme. It is clear from the main talk by the uh, chairperson of the Public Service Commission, uh, uh, Professor Somadoda Fikeni, that we have reached a crisis point. Uh, and Professor Fikeni, your current role is unenviable as the chair of Public Service Commission because this is a constitutional body and it has a specific uh, mandate. It is the only chapter 10 of the constitution which makes its place in addressing our public service problems very integral. So it is befitting indeed that he's speaking uh, uh, in the manner that he did. But I think the Public Service Commission itself needs to go beyond doing reports and reporting to parliament. But I agree with your notion that a new consciousness, but I also would like to call it rehumanizing our public service is actually uh, needed. So Professor Fikeni was very clear that we have taken a detour uh, in our democracy experiment. Uh, and I think I want to agree with him that South Africa is at a tipping point of service delivery. Northwest is no different at all because we know that we have and we are continuing to experience untold levels of poverty. Uh, our public schools, our hospitals, our roads, our infrastructure are dehumanizing our communities. Uh, the singers were here, and uh, you will agree with, with me that they invoked the lyrics and beautiful melody of Vicky Sampson on the African dream, and I believe we need to, uh, sorry, the, the African dream that we need to rise. And I think Moses Kotani's life is our model tonight to help us rise, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Moses Kotani's values have been violated in a significant way by all of us, by our governments, by our municipalities, by our public service. It is clear also from uh, the VC, uh, Professor Chobeka, that Moses Kotani was a constitutionalist. So the violation of our, uh, the, our deeds was actually a violation of the uh, constitution. He is a forerunner in the framing of the character of our constitution. He was a uniting figure in the midst of despair, he was a towering intellectual that was not just ideological, as we often are, but he understood the needs of the society. The poet asked if we can learn a thing or two from Moses Kotani, ladies and gentlemen. Program director, I want to provoke you a little bit and ask you and the audience if we really still have communists in South Africa that can come and emulate the values of Moses Kotani that will unite this country, that will speak about adherence to, to the constitution that would be incorruptible. The premier's views are also pertinent that Moses Kotani remains were returned to this province. But I also want to be a bit more provocative again, uh, program uh, director, that we need to ask ourselves, 
if we are proud to bring Moses Kodani's remains back to South Africa so that we could embarrass him. I'm talking about the, what is happening in our provinces. If you look at our security cluster, I'm not even sure if we still have a security, uh, 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 safety and security in South Africa. Our SAPS, our uh, uh, SSA, our NPA, you can name them. We hear of corruption that are repeated daily. But I also want to say, Prof. Fiken is correct to highlight that we have taken a detour as democracy. And this is important because he speaks about a career politician and this is not going to bring about service delivery. So I think it's something we really need to reflect on in a very significant manner. This means uh, the leadership role has widened up and that means it could include everyone and everything without integrity and without competence. He spoke about the fact that our capture actually started with the national liberation and therefore renders uh, Moses Kotani, uh, the Moses Kotanis of this world irrelevant. We are indeed in the era of destroying and detour. I want to finish off by making some few consideration, uh, program director, to provoke a more meaningful conversation that would relate to the theme of tonight, but also the, uh, the realities on the ground. And the first consideration is how can we forge meaningful partnerships with the national, provincial, and government departments and SOEs, the VC spoke about some of the existing. And as I speak, you have government departments that are still working in silos. They don't have uh, capacity, skills, but they still continue to function in that way, hoping that something would work out at some point, and it will not. I want to ask you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, Professor, uh, Samadu Rafikeni in his role as the chairperson of Public Service Commission, that what is the role of Public Service Commission in realizing the values of the Constitution? How can Public Service Commission take over the role of appointing senior government officials in national government and in provincial government? The animal of regionalism and ethnicity is rearing its head through job reservations in provinces and municipalities. So I'm talking from a very long wealth of experience and this is happening throughout the country. People are complaining that you've got this ethnic group in our municipality, in our province, and this is South Africa. And I think if Public Service Commission is going to stay on the sideline and not take over those responsibilities we are going to go down uh, in our public institutions. Colleagues, we have speeches and documents from government that clearly demonstrate in many cases that our, executive, uh, our executives, for example, ministers, MECs, mayors, etc., they don't always demonstrate that they know or understand their role in public policy. So if you take any document from government and read, you wonder, do they, does this really captures the role of a, a, a public policy in articulation, in, in, in formulation, and in, 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 in addressing societal issues? I agree with the notion of a professionalization of public service uh, uh, program director. I think that is imperative and the initiative needs to address at the core the political deployment because if we don't deal with the elephant in the room we are just gonna go uh, in circles I believe. The question of unlearning uh, program director means that firstly we need to massify uh, education and training uh, in government, but on the other hand, if our crime-fighting institutions are not activated and strengthened 
urgently, if NPA is not going to work, if police are not going to work, we are still going to be in trouble for a very long time. So for me, those are the major priorities that our government should be looking into while we are working towards the professionalization of public service uh, project. How do we work towards regaining trust and credibility uh, in government, so we are in trouble because we know, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Kotze mentioned that the, the, there are studies that are out there that have demonstrated that all the political parties trust it's really going down in a very significant way. So we are sitting uh, in that kind of a uh, scenario but we need to galvanize. We need to galvanize society. We need to have traditional leadership. We need to have NGOs. We need to have businesses and other critical sectors of our society to return to their roles. They have detoured for a long time and they really need to come uh, urgently. Uh, lastly, Chair, our future, and I want to agree with Prof uh, Kotze, that our future is coalition government, and we see it's coming. Uh, can we unpack and imagine those arrangements in detail? We need a legislation to mitigate the anarchy that comes with those as we are seeing this happening uh, in the metros. Thank you, program director. Thank you very much. I'm now uh, in the end of my facilitation. The only difference is that I'm not neutral. Uh, Clement uh, Manogu is going to take over. Three things from me because I'm not neutral. One, I still want to be convinced as to whether it's possible that South African health system could be properly transformed with the existence of the Medical Aid Schemes Act. Which act, unlike in any other society, 90% of South African citizens share 10% of the resources. And 10% of, of the citizens share 90% of the resources. Second one, because I'm not neutral, it's not whether you should have step aside or not. It's whether step aside linked to a charge by an independent body that we have no control over is not the reason why each one of us who has an intention to take down another one, simply does not go to a meeting of a branch, but goes to a court of law to push for a charge so that consequentially it steps a step aside. And that too has a possibility of co-opting law enforcement agencies in fights over political disagreements. Let me go. Thank you very much. Okay, um, there was a group here in South Africa called uh, Stimela. There was a song, tell me, tell me, where did we go wrong? And now, Professor Fikeni did ask that question. And he also went further to say, the needle may have widened or stolen. The Vice Chancellor, Prof. Tobeka, indicated or alluded to a question what would Moses Kotani do? There are all these issues. We don't have much time. We are going to limit questions and I'm going to start that side. Oh, <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> I'm going to start that side. Maybe I can take two, that side. Two, two. I see one. Let's go, Prof. Andrew. And you can uh, 
just indicate who you are directing the questions to. Uh, thank you, Program Director. Um, to the Moses Kotani Foundation, uh, all political uh, leaders and colleagues and guests, it's a real honor to be here on this uh, really critical uh, time in our history. And I thank uh, our Honorable Premier and Prof, uh, Prof Sambata for uh, Prof Sam, um, Sam daughter. Yeah. Beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for, 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 for the words that they have spoken. You see, it's easy to confuse the two. Yeah, let's, get back to, let's go straight to it. Let's get straight to it. I, I, I'm getting to it. People have been asking for the paradigm shift, and we've got to think differently. We've just come through. I, my name is uh, Professor Andrew Robinson. I'm a public health physician, and uh, I'm a deputy dean in this university, and I've served this government since 2006. Uh, just today and yesterday, uh, I've been appointed by MEC Mkhosho to sit in the audit committee and two of our MEC's departments, I've sat on their the, the provincial audit committees, so I've got a good idea of, of what is going on. Yep. Now, yeah. we've just come through a pandemic, very important, and it's important globally, the, the virus found a sick human population and a sick planet. Mm. And it's very important in anyone's healing to, uh, to recognize that one is sick. If you don't, you cannot facilitate the healing process. Or, uh, now, we've recognized that, and we think, what can we do? What must be different? Now, the important thing, and I just need to explain this quickly, and I, I'm I've got 41 days till I retire, so I can speak fairly frankly. Uh, I just want to explain two things. We want two concepts, to be a part of and to be a part from. I think that has, is, the, is the fundamental philosophy of where we find ourselves today. Because as a human race, we find ourselves a part from Mother Earth, apart from nature. And our traditional um, leadership and our indigenous knowledge systems have recognized this all along. We are part of this planet. Yesterday at COP27, a study that I'm the principal investigator was, present, uh, was presented at COP for the first time demonstrating in South Africa, the importance of, uh, of reversing the non-communicable chronic diseases, which are far worse. Who would think in Africa, non-communicable diseases, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cancers, will be worse in Africa than communicable diseases? And that has happened. Mm -hmm. That is the pandemic. Yep. And the... the Separateness, to be a part of, I think all of us know apartheid is a classic example of separateness. And if you're separate, you create difference, you create uh, divisions, you create um, uh, scarcity. Yet the African, old African knowledge of IKS has never been that, has always been of together. Ubuntu. Things happen together. So to be a part of this nature and, and the paradigm shift of this university is to shift the scientific lens of paradigm which in the last 400 years and even the last 10,000 years as human beings have separated from nature, the prime scientific and technological uh, yeah. uh, effort has been how to dominate and extract from the world. And that domination and extraction has shown just recently this year how the northern countries had all the vaccines, southern nothing. 
Okay. Now, one moment. I'm just no, closing. I, I think I'm going to rule you out now, uh, uh, Prof. Robri, It's because important that the university adopts this paradigm of working with. Their intellectual capital must be directed, and that is the paradigm. And it's an old African notion. It's not something new, and it works. And it needs to be revisited. And I'm working with uh, Prof. Bismarck, who's, I acknowledge his uh, adjunct uh, appointment as a professor. I'm working with him on the Northwest University's medical school business plan. Yes. And if we don't shift the paradigm to that, the current medical schools in South Africa have left us with a health legacy where we are now, unhealthy. We need to shift the paradigm. Okay, so I think what we are going to do now, I'm going to, I know that we are passionate. I know that we are South Africans. And paramount is why are we here? To remember Moses Kotan. And there are speakers who made presentations. And there are questions that are posed. And I know you have questions of clarification or probing. That's where I want us to go. And these speakers here are waiting for that. I just want us to be focused because otherwise we are going to be everywhere. And I'm going to make sure that your mic doesn't work if you are going to focus on issues that are not helping us to arrive at solutions that are posed here. I do appreciate everyone's points, please believe me, but we have time constraints. We have started late. Some people are sick, they need to eat. The next question. Ntati Pech. All the... Yeah, 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 you are now capacitated. All, all the speakers they spoke about the challenges, they painted the very bad pictures to our country, to the situation that we're facing. Now my caution to them is that we're all for the developmental state. Now, how are we going to build the developmental state with the challenges or the picture that we've painted to us? All of you, you painted that picture which you are in a very, very bad situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, please um, just uh, uh, mark those questions. I have a question here. Sir? Please enable him. No, no, no. Uh, just wait because there are people who are online. They may need to hear you speak. And there is a question, ma'am. Am I? Okay. Uh, the, the theme is about the research in South Africa's journey. I want to understand why the focus of all the speakers is on the statist approach to research in the journey. That is, it is all grounded on the state. I understand I had Professor Figeni in a cursory note remark on agency. And mm -hmm. I thought perhaps you should, be, you should have paid attention. Just lastly, two points. There seem to be a tendency to, of treason amongst people like yourself to avoid engaging with some falsehoods in society. One, the idea of a generational mix often emerges only when we talk politics, hmm. which means easy things. It is nowhere else where society is concerned. And you don't seem to want to engage with that issue, with the falsehood of that. <clears throat> the second issue has to do with what I would refer to as Eugene Rivers, the nationalism of fools, where, where you hear people talking about you can't substitute a woman with a man. You remember the debate about when there was supposed to be a new public protector when Tuli left. The argument in the interview was that if a woman occupies a post, you can't substitute that with a man, thereby creating a long-term struggle in the future. If it is not like that, it is you can't substitute a black man or a black woman with a white person, which also fits very well with what I call nationalism of, nationalism of fools. 
and we don't engage with that ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, let's have, let's have your question, then we can come this side for commentary. Thank you, sir. Um, all protocols observed. Uh, Prof. Figeni mentioned a very profound thing. And he said, you know, um, you find somebody who did anthropology being a project manager in our, in our municipalities, in our government. And this is for the premier to say, in, what is the plan for you, premier, for Northwest? to make sure that the right people with the right qualifications are, are deployed or appointed at the right positions to ensure that they serve our, our communities properly and they know what they're doing. What is the plan there? We're losing so much knowledge. We see Madiben going down. I was at Nexa a few days ago. It's falling apart because knowledge is being depleted not the right people at the head. We're just deploying people there. Skills are leaving. What is the plan, Premier, from thank you. you? Thank you, thank you. Um, in no particular order of addressing those comments, uh, let's, uh, we can go. The panel? Yes, please. Please uh, enable, uh, empower the professor. Yes, very quickly, we can't obviously spend enough time on each topic, but my approach was deliberately not focused on state alone. Hence the mention of family. Hence the mention of agency within communities. And one concrete example as a community development activist, I would mention premier and leadership. We're already spending more than 300 billion rands on social grants. But what are we doing creatively to make that money circulate within communities? Because people are buying food. They're buying uniform for church and schools. They're buying other items what do we do to incentivize those who actually go back to the community rather than go to spa, shop right, and so forth? That money hardly ever come to the village to say hello. It says goodbye before it has even arrived. And yet that money, whether you have fiscal challenges or not, is already there in the community. I agree that the issue of indigenous knowledges and the emphasis on preventive health is key. I was working with Professor Perpeta at Nelson Mandela University in establishing a faculty of health that would adopt what other countries like Cuba and several others have done, where you emphasize on prevention in your health system rather than on cure. Because once you wait until you are sick, you cure. Very expensive. On the issue of um, the appointments at the Public Service Commission, and the AG has revealed this, if your HR is weak, and it is interfered with politically, forget. Because recruitment, talent identification, promotion, consequence management, training, wellness, everything is there. The moment you make that system collapse, that's when you are going to get a person without qualifications doing the work. Take the Prasa issue, which ought to embarrass everyone. How for two years can you hear in the media, and the minister mentions it in parliament, that we have some 3,000 ghost employees? 
and two years later, ghosts are still working and ghosts are still earning salary. Ghosts are getting performance bonus. Ghosts. We just have to take statecraft seriously. Mm. We're just not serious. It's the same thing as the school delivery some years back in Limpopo and the Eastern Cape. It was in the media, the challenge of delivering books, and you start wondering if South Africa is not suffering from an acute common sense deficit. Because at a certain point, why can't you just say, let's stop working today and carry books to these schools? Mm. Why? It's because the business model of corruption is so well embedded that people were still thinking who is going to benefit from what. That's why many people pray for the death of icons so that they get a tender for that marquee tent and for something else. You steal PPE money, you steal funeral money for Mandela and so forth, and you think that we're still going to be okay here. There's something that has gone fundamentally wrong. And that thing of common sense deficit, I take it seriously because most systems were made so complex because we don't want accountability. And that's the reason why when tender adjudication committee sits, the person who confuses them the most with graphs they can't understand is the one who is going to be appointed because they suspect that is knowledge. <laughs> when that report comes back, they do not know what to do. They will appoint somebody to decipher this Rosetta Stone code. When in fact certain things are just commonsensical. It's that same reason that today you are told save energy, save water. You drive through townships. Street lights, the one that consume the most, are on during the day. You go to Kleberka, we have zero, what is it, uh, uh, you know, day zero coming. Save water. You find water running through the street. And you start saying, there's something we lost. And this thing is not very complicated. It's just common sense. But once you apply common sense, corruption will have less space, though. Thanks. I think that is a very important question about uh, appointment of people in positions who do not have the requisite qualifications. I think there are multiple uh, number of things that can be done to try and deal with that problem. I think uh, you can decide on uh, conduct your skills audit and you try to uh, take out of the system those who do not have the requisite qualifications. I think you can ensure that uh, there's a regular performance assessment and uh, you deal with those that uh, perform below the required uh, level. But I think these issues will be just uh, addressing the symptoms. They won't really be dealing with the problem. I think the problem is more structural. I think uh, if you ask the question, who appoints the HOD? Who appoints those who report to the HOD? Who appoints those? And uh, you try to establish, do people who are given this uh, weighty responsibility, do they understand that they have to focus more on competence and uh, ethical behavior, or are they focusing on something else? And so I think it's more structural, institutional problem. And I think uh, yeah, Patrick Musiani says we don't want to address the issues. And I think what is uh, currently uh, the debate, the uh, initiative led by uh, uh, Professor Fikeni 
about how we professionalize the public service. And it's going to take some time. And uh, I can bet you there's going to be resistance. And I think uh, Professor Der Kotze referred to it, delinking the political leadership from the public servants. How do we do that? Uh, if you are seated there in the, uh, amongst the audience there and you are a political leader, do you agree with it? That we have to do it. Are you going to accept it? Mm -hmm. And uh, his uh, assertion is that as long as we, we are not dealing with this problem, uh, just, just imagine uh, I am seated there I must uh, evaluate someone who is the uh, secretary of the organization. In, uh, he's at the same time a chief director in the department. How do you deal with this? Who is uh, calling the shots? Uh, mm. You know, uh, can you really effectively do it? You know, so there'll be these, these challenges. But, but like, like I said, addressing in the interim those symptoms, it's important, it's necessary. Let's do what we can. Let's not say we'll uh, await the adoption of uh, the approach advocated by Prof Professor Fikeni. Let's try to deal with uh, the bad apples. Let's try to identify them and uh, try to weed them out of the system. Again, there sometimes it, it's a battle. Uh, uh, we said it, uh, everything is captured, including the unions. The unions can defend somebody who everyone can see this person is guilty of malfeasance. And the person can mobilize the union and the union can defend this person. And how do we deal with that situation? They say, if you touch this one, <laughs> the entire system will collapse. And how do we, so I'm saying there are a number of problems, but we need uh, new thinking, we need new paradigm. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, I heard you, uh, Patrick, I was at uh, one function, I was looking at the average age of, uh, of executives in banks in South Africa, and institutions like the DBSA and the, the PIC and so on. And I was pleasantly surprised that uh, the average age there is 40. So there are young people in the country. And some of these institutions, of course, some are captured, are known for their excellence. And they are headed by young Africans, young Africans. I mean, I can tell you here today, the, the uh, NetBank. NetBank CEO is still uh, a white person, but the chairperson is African. The CEO is African. Uh, the executives are African. One of them, I mean, surprised me when he very young, told me his qualifications. He's got a PhD in applied mathematics and a PhD in computer science. And so we do have some institutions here that reflect that we have the ability, we have these pockets of excellence. And of course, we have the many, particularly in local municipalities and provincial and national government, some who just go there for what is called the sinecure. People who are paid for doing nothing, for just going in there and leaving. I mean, sometimes uh, when I, I, I take my lunch from the office. When I return from my lunch, I can see a number of people leaving. I mean, after lunch, they have their bags, the ladies and the men. So you can see there's lack of a commitment. Of course, we have to investigate what are the reasons. We may be the reasons why people are not showing this commitment to their work. We may be the reasons. But uh, as Professor Fikeni has said, these type of topics will require more discussion, more debate. But I want to emphasize that uh, we have to think about a paradigm shift. We have to do things differently. Otherwise, it will just be uh, stationary running and we'll think we are moving whilst we are not. Thank you. Um, 
Well, there's not much left for me to talk about. I, I think that there was a question why the focus is on, Af on, on the state. I tried to explain that I've made this particular choice about it, um, and that it focused on institutions, which is possibly the easier option to deal with and to, to address. The more difficult ones are the ones about values, about ethics, about um, changes of patterns of organization and so on. So I, as a political scientist, look more at the specific political components and the state, whether you like it or not, is the mo one of the most important uh, players or participants or drill players in politics. Um, and one cannot get away from it. About the developmental state, I think we don't have a good understanding of what we mean by the developmental state. The developmental state in, in terms of research work is a very specific type of state, and that is a state which is um, very highly capacitated in terms of the, the uh, uh, human resource capacity that they have. So the state, in terms of the public sector, the public administration, is in a position where they, they have a lot of capacity to deliver goods, to deliver services. That's something with which we don't have at this point in time in South Africa. It's also a state which agreed on a very close partnership between the private sector and the public sector. If you go to countries like South Korea, um, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, which are all the classic examples of developmental states, that is how they did it. It is, the, the, there's a close, what President Ramaphosa talks about, of a social compact. I think that's where his idea of a social compact actually comes from, is this notion of that there's this very close partnership, uh, alliance between the private sector and the public sector. Then the one controversial one, which we don't talk about, is that these developmental states, st starting with Japan in the, after the Second World War, South Korea, um, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, you, you can name them, were all one-party states, not democratic. Trade unions, for example, in most of those countries were never allowed. Yeah? The result is low production costs, low costs in terms of salaries, high growth rates. And that made it possible for them to go over 10% and more. And now that is partly the model that's being presented to South Africa. But the problem is, where are the examples of democratic developmental states? Some talk about Brazil, some talk about Botswana, but that's more or less where it ends. You know? And they are not themselves even, they don't themselves regard them as developmental states. So the idea of development is something which I think there's no question about, there's absolute consensus about it, but the question is how to do it. Yeah? And what will be the institutional and state and political arrangements to do it? Will all of us be willing to say, well, some of our political rights for this moment of development can actually be curtailed for the sake of development? Like trade union rights, for example, yeah. or not. Yeah. The thing, that's the big point. Just a quick one from my side. Uh, uh, I think a lot of these issues have been addressed, is that uh, the state is at the center of what is happening, and the concentration of resources, of leadership, is in the state. And so, if we don't focus on state capacity and the concerns that revolve around the state, because it, it plays a role of the distribution of resources within the society. So that can actually make your NGO uh, funding, your in, in the current model we have, the funding of traditional leadership. So it's quite an important uh, uh, player. Thank you. OK. I recognize two questions this side. Um, one, two. OK, you'll be third. Sir, um, can you please assist? Let's be straight to the point. 
No, thank you. I, I, I think the program director had already done the greetings and all that on our behalf. Uh, Prof, I would have wanted to ask you if it is your view in relation to coalition that uh, coalitions are positive or it's an academic reasoning because I think I've read Haywood and Dijache when they spoke about the coalition and its negative uh, impact that it has made globally in other countries where they had contested. And also, I'm, I'm happy that uh, today we're speaking about the Ray Moses Kotani as a renowned leader of the Communist Party. And I've heard uh, Prof. Uh, Madodafikeni speaking about the, whole, uh, the, the needle or the eye of the needle that has widened. Ray Moses Kotani being a renowned leader of the Communist Party that sits in meetings of the ANC when there are least processes. How would he have viewed the Communist Party that sits in least processes of the ANC and allows capacity to be removed and be replaced by fools? Okay. Furthermore, I'm happy that Utata uh, Dr. Mavuso is here. He's one leader that I've always looked at to be a factionalist. I'm sorry to say. Factionist. A factionalist. <laughs> I've always viewed you like that, Tata. And I've always viewed you that you are taking sides in the ANC. But to my shock is that he was brave enough just like President Habumbeki. And I think the likes of Moses, uh, Ray Moses Kotani would have loved that we have such leaders in our country who can stand up with any position because a leader makes a position but a position does not make a leader. Hmm. And I would have wanted to ask the Communist Party and our leaders seated there, in the current uh, politics or in the current environment of politics, how would have Ray Moses Kotani viewed the current state of the ANC? Because its face is facing challenges. And when the face or the head is facing challenges, the whole body becomes sick. So the state of the country is sick because each and every president that we have had after Comrade President Mandela and Comrade Mbeki, most of them, they have appeared to have been scandalous. Even the current president appears to be scandalous. And our comrades, when they are in podiums, they are even afraid to raise this matter. <laughs> Like Comrade President Tawumbeki okay. has raised it and how Comrade uh, Msimang has raised it. I no longer regard you as a factionalist. I regard you as a leader of the society who reasons okay. like uh, Moses Kotani. Thank you. I'm going to be consistent. So, did I hear an apology of sorts? <laughs> it's not coming out. Is it coming out? I apologize for thinking <laughs> that you are that kind of a person. That's, okay, leadership, no, you can sit down. It's please. true that you must apologize because young people are seen as yeah. those who don't apologize. Absolutely. And radicalism, <laughs> it's not of those who don't apologize. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Direct. I'm Bulalo Zepe the district secretary of the South African Communist Party in this district, in this province. This collaboration between the University of Northwest and the Premier of the Northwest is well received to recognize the contribution of our General Secretary. The presentation 
by Premier, indicated with, I accept and support the diversity that must be tapped on around the world. He has indicated the question of the Latin America. Mm -hmm. This, I link it to the national dialogue that Professor Fikane has indicated to, and also the paradigm shift indicated by Professor, Professor um, mm -hmm. uh, Kutsi. That given that our general sector was waging class struggle, now, the question of the struggle around this particular debate would actually, to me, be relevant on addressing the national dialogue, which that national dialogue must also tap into the CODESA. Exactly what, what, what actually um, compromises that were actually impacted upon that are impacting negatively currently. The paradigm shift also must also tap into this national dialogue into say the current status quo in terms of ownership mm. that were there before 1994 is still recurring. What would the Malume comment about this particular status quo? that is not even shaken, that the ownership in terms of the economy as it was in the past is still in few hands. Yeah. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. I uh, saw one last hand there. Oh, yes, I recognize that. Please, to the point. Uh, but, uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Pawa Tsonzoti, a PEC member of the South African Communist Party in Moses Kotal. Uh, I'll try to be as much short as possible. One, Moses Kotan was an internationalist and would be doing injustice uh, his legacy. If you are going to speak to how the World Health Organization and your Bretton Woods Institute and all these uh, 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 all these people that are pushing capital, that are protecting capital, influences our country and sustain your, your, your capitalist, I mean your developed countries at the expense of your peripheral, peripheral countries, uh, like your developing countries like South Africa. That's number one. Number two, one thing that we don't confront is the tenderization of the state and how it has contributed into the mess that we are in. One. Two. Uh, if we have seen that the tenderization of the state has become a problem, mm. what other solutions do we have to make sure that we, we, we sort out the national question that I think has not been addressed? Hence the professor in this address, or is it, is the, is it the premier, who speaks that when you're in Northwest, or the professor of School of Governance, when you're in Northwest, for you to be a director, if you've got a stronger name or vendor name, uh, it's, it's seen as a taboo. It does not seen as the skill that you are bringing to the province. So those are the questions that I think should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is this uh, fellow South African. Yeah. I owe him for his patience. To the point, sir. Thank you. Indeed, you owe me. Nakalina uh, Manje Mojana, Premier. Agitura Dr. Somado da Fikenu was to an Kibata Hela or Gita Arabe before Jagos Queen, Karabe, Kanya Hawaya for Relatile Kai. Em Rebuas Quatat As a result, everything gets lost in translation. Now, keta mo ko na premiera le VCA University. Wabona nalti Dr. Fikeni Ayabatang. Emo templating 
ene dirwa ke batho ba ne ba dira ANC na go tlo go kopa premier i'm going to put forward se ke se akanyang and then lo ona le bona gore as university le government le ka gwana gore le se dire you see the needle you are looking for uh, dr fiken is right here in the northwest including the template of how the oldest liberation movement was conceived and how it was incubated the same people ke ba rolo remape the symbiotic relationship between mafiken and tabanjo is what conceived what we call the ANC today now as the university i would like and love for when i university as government leader a program a research one to research how our stalwarts formulated a proper functioning government what we call the liberation movement how they set out goals to achieve things that they did they created churches your zcc was incubated here in your province St John's Church and interestingly uh, the Freemasons lodge that was uh, established in Tabanjo ended up being what we call now today Kerekasi uh, Piri so no 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 in all honesty premier all these stalwarts in memory of Moses Kotani you have to go back pre 1912 and see who you will find that there's a lot i'm answering your question premier there's a lot of stalwarts within this province who created what we now know as the anc so i'm asking you are you and your government and the university going to collaborate and dig deeper to find the needle that we are looking for because it's still there it's not lost it's not widened it's just swept under the carpet thank you yeah at least it's not stolen um Shall we go to the extreme left my left please um it's only fair that uh, Dr Babuso say something because there was something directed at him personally <laughs> but also I had thought that before you go forward you must go back and that's why he's talking now Doc Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come here. Uh, I, I'm really, particularly, I feel important, you know. <laughs> Premier did, uh, and many of the people sitting there, and I'm happy to have been with the audience uh, listening to really some pretty profound things taking place about our country. Um, you talk about sh paradigm shifts. I wonder if you have considered this shift um I, i'm i'm very anc I, no apologies uh never mind what people think sometimes when i throw stones uh, uh, i'm throwing stones at my own place um <clears throat> the anc if it fails to provide the leadership that it started um a long time ago and that assisted us to gain our freedom if it loses its direction paulo jordan has written a paper that says he fears that this might be the lost the, the the loss of the liberation project the whole issue of liberating people may be lost if the anc completely fails to get its act together and continue to govern uh, in the expected manner so there was talk about the future being um what you call it coalitions i i have a fear i mean that may very well be i wish we could get to a future uh, if it's unavoidable where you have got uh, uh, coalitions of responsible people coalitions require a lot of maturity the fact that you are a coalition means you are not one party you um, embrace different things but you agree 
to work together on things that are common. But if the current example with local government is anything to go by, why don't we think of another paradigm? If we can't resuscitate the ANC, what vehicle can be used to preserve our democracy going forward? Is there a way of organizing ourselves for the sake of our country outside the political framework as it exists today of parties. I mean, I wouldn't like if the ANC really did its worst. I would never go to the EFF. I'm sorry if there are some people there. I mean, I, I can't go to people who behave like thugs and things like that, you see. <clears throat> I couldn't go to the DA. They don't seem to know that 1994 came to this country. We've just expelled yeah. a number of very, <laughs> I think, uh, Good people, Mazibugo, Maimane, and so on. Thanks, so Doc. Where are we going? Is there a paradigm in which you act outside of a political party framework? Yeah. That may be a possibility. It's difficult. I don't know whether it, it but it should be considered just like, yeah. Yeah. Just like the ANC now. <laughs> people are talking about Palapala. No, you know, uh, <coughs> you, uh, I thought you would blame me for, give me, I'm older than you guys, give me a little bit of time. <coughs> so, <coughs> I thought you would criticize me for not being critical sufficiently of state capture and Zuma and all those nasty things that have really reduced this country to where we are. I, I, I did my best. Um, not enough was done. This country was destroyed not just through the monies that were stolen, but the destruction of institutions. Complete destruction. Placement of people who have no competence and placement of other people who just want to steal. That is what state capture, whenever you try to philosophize about other things, when that regime came into power, it was to steal. It was to take things away, to put completely incompetent people in power. So, so, but when Palapala happened, I mean, really, <clears throat> how could you keep quiet when somebody in a country that has got so many poor people talks about, no, 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 it wasn't five million dollars, maybe three million. Gosh, this is sinful, you know. You can hardly give people enough money. You give them 350 and expect them that they will last through the month. This is where we are, right at the top, playing around with uh, millions, not of rand, but of dollars. Whatever was happening there, and I'm not interested, it doesn't smell good at all. And these paradigms, the ANC, <laughs> the fate of the president is in the hands of people who are investigating him. And if they were to decide that he actually has a case to answer, who is thinking about what needs to happen? We're going to get one of the vultures want to be president to go and take this thing, or are you going to look for some nice good guys from the ANC and say, move forward. We want you to take power for a short term and let these others become presidents and deputies and NEC, but let's take our country across to 2024 with a credible person who might reinstate the values of the NC. I've abused the opportunity you gave me. Thank you very much. No, don't apologize at all. Um, you want to comment on those? Uh, I have seen um, there are some young people there who I, I would want them to say something because the future is theirs. Uh, <laughs> now, thank you, Program Director. Hey, I was going to start accusing you of factionalism. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm humbled to be in the presence of the Premier. My question is one is that the theme is saying resetting the gene 
uh, resetting South Africa's journey towards recovery. And our understanding is that resetting is bringing something back to factory settings. So my question is that because uh, we've seen that the current policies, in terms of policies, are not working. The country has been declining since 1994. So don't you think it's new time to all the panelists? Is a time for us to set and define a new journey for us, which uh, of the journey is going, uh, uh, sorry, which uh, the journey includes a new policy in terms of uh, socialism that is going to then replace the capitalism that weakened the state as a whole from the SOEs to the uh, government uh, department. So my question is that don't you think it's time for us to look at alternative which is socialism, but not socialism as Marx defined it as uh, the power in the hands of the proletariat, but the socialism that is going to then allow free markets and move the country forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have uh, 10 minutes for this Q&A, then we are we're going to back to the program because we need to have vote of thanks and uh, we depart. There is a question here. Sir? Or, or maybe give, him, give it to him so uh, we are efficient in handling this. Uh, sorry, all protocol observed. Um, just a quick one. I, I just want maybe the panel to, uh, when they talk about a paradigm shift, um, as South Africans, we've always been um, led astray by populism. And I just want to find out, are, are our old leaders that we, they, they, they used to move us with speeches and, and all that, and what we have at the moment, do, do, do we maybe need a populist to, to come and uh, sort of drive us in the di uh, right direction? Because I, I think as a country we are really moved by more of speeches than, the, than activity. But uh, um, uh, while we are saying that, uh, we've also, the, the problem with that also has been the fact that we've personalized our struggles to, to individuals. How, how are we going to get rid of that in terms of making sure that uh, we get to the days of UDF where people were really, really committed to, 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 to fighting for real freedom, not to fighting for themselves or for, the, uh, for themselves to, 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 to just emerge uh, out of this. Thank you. Um, sir, there is a question there. Uh, this gentleman has been agitating to make very progressive solutions <laughs> going forward. Ask is my brother. Um, thank you so much. Uh, let me first start off by congratulating this initiative. It's much needed. Thank you so much, leadership. Dr. Steve, um, well done, and thank you. Um, I just want to say to all of us in here, we are sitting here speaking big English in an um, environment that is beautiful, but in absence of good things, bad things become good. Mm. Right now we are in a university where there's a lot of young people who could, you know, be harnessing this information for the future. And they are not here. In a place where they actually should be here, this hall should be full of young people. But my, what I want to say is, even when you look at the narrative that has been perpetuated out there through media, mm. The media that is consumed by people on the ground is not here. Kibono FM, I saw um, not, uh, UFM yeah. and this SABC microphone, but communities where the people are, there's no community media here. You know what I mean? And we want this message to get to where the people are, but we are not inviting the people. And we could come back and say, no, it's because they are not professional and whatnot, but we all come from certain communities here. We cannot leave our communities and expect things to be automatic when we are not infusing assistance in where they come from or, or where they are. So my request is, as we hold these initiatives and whatnot, let's bring the people in where we are because we want this thing, Banabaskatsubadi, bubbly all the time. They could be consuming yes. content, and this content should be digitized, to be quite honest. So those are just my smaller and submissions to what is going on here, but thank you yeah, in Thank essence. you very much. The the media is invited. 
I think the time in terms of the students, we have the student leadership, some of them are here, they are writing exams, it's actually a no activity period now for students, so there are all these things, but I think the organizers, these are lessons learned, maybe the time, the days of doing this, there will be discussions of course, and there must be improvement, so that feedback will send up some platform the way you can give such feedback. Thank you very much. Um, shall we have uh, comments, comments coming from this side? Uh, please, let's have the sound. So I take it now yes. the program director has left me. No, no by, by, by constitution I should have left you a long time ago. The general secretary of the Communist Party is not here. And the question is directed to the Communist Party. Aha, let's go. The only CC member, CC member who's here is me. <laughs> <laughs> and comrade Soli. No, okay. no, I'm joking. No, no, the, the, issue, the issue, Chair, is I must join uh, Uput Mavuzu. But the question is whether the ANC at this current form is ready to be rescued. It's one element that we must ponder. I agree with him on pondering organizational options in case the rescue fails because there's dominance of contestation of the rescue plan. If it were to be the SACP, let me disclose, would have never preferred the ANC to go to an elective conference at the state it is. We even formalized that through a bilateral that the ANC must go to a consultative conference that creates a platform for its unity and rescue and extend the term. Then later in another five years, come back for an elective conference. Reality is, as we said here today, just the contestation on its own has nothing to do with the rescue and reorganizing. It has to do with how people will ad, ad survive post-conference. The issue of Palapala, yes, is wrong. But the fact of the matter is it sets up against what we did in Pulukwane, myself included, on scorpions. Mm. With me included on scorpions. Those that did not want scorpions, majority of them had cases to answer. And those that want the fall of the Angole themselves have cases to answer, including possibility of kicking out of the door, not the window, the State Capture Commission report and its implications. So then the, 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 the needle, through the eye of the needle, the bigger it becomes, it's extended internally. It is not extended by partners. It's extended internally as a basis to deepen the strength of the capture. The capture is internal before outside. That's why we will not succeed, Professor Fikini, in professionalizing the public sector for as long our own organization does not accept being professionalized itself in the coming conference. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that input. I do think that the question of whether ANC should be saved or not, and what happens if it is not saved. I would rather say ANC should work towards moving towards the aspirations of the people rather than the aspirations of itself and the aspirations of the factions. The longer it is busy self-mutilating in a corner, 
through these factional battles, the less intellectual power it is left to think strategically about national interests. Because the biggest thing now is how to dislodge the person next to you. But I do think that whatever the case might be, the values that it espoused may survive. But the messengers might bury each other through this cannibalization that you see. The question of coalition, it's, I, I no longer think it's a question of whether you like it or not. All proportional representative systems around the world are designed to produce coalitions. That Namibia in South Africa have remained outside has been an anomaly. The question is, what should we do fast enough to make sure that such coalitions have institutional arrangements to function in a stable, mature manner in the service of the people. And the one last point I want to raise, the issue of populism. Maybe let me start by responding to Prof. Kotze, the notion of a developmental state and democracy. But I'll put it in a different manner. We could have the best constitution, but if material conditions of people on the ground are getting worse, they will not forever embrace, protect that constitution. Autocracy or populist options or authoritarian systems will become more attractive if they believe that when we refer to the Constitution, we're referring to something intangible. One of the reasons for that is because our main emphasis is on the first generation human rights of Chapter 2 of the Constitution. Right to speak, rights of association, right? We hardly ever talk about the second generation human rights, which talk about providing material conditions for people to live better. The reason we do not do that is because the elite in business, in politics and elsewhere are afraid to talk about critical trade-offs that should be made for that to be possible. Because it disturbs their lifestyle. And yet the second transition ought to start talking about what are those trade-offs? What are those sacrifices that ought to be made so that a person who lives by eating out of a garbage bin while some people are buying seven cars, 14 properties. It's insane. And we do not realize that the more we allow this inequality, the more suicidal it is. You can't, no matter how many security cameras you have, continue protecting yourself when other people go out without food for days. We can't be healthy when around you have diseases until we understand that particular element people will be driven to the hands of anything if our democratic experiment fails them now and it's a banning platform and lastly i do think that populism we should not embrace populism for the sake of populism. If I understand as a political scientist what populism is, where somebody promises instant delivery and miracles, 
and use a language where easy solutions are presented for complex problems. Donald Trump was a populist. Bonsenario in Brazil was a populist who went on to chop half or one quarter of Amazon. And there are several other populists which are coming up. It's not sustainable because the moment you are thrown in, I would even say Lee's trust in Britain was a populist. He looked for easy answers. No, I'm going to cut this text. You are going to have these breaks and so forth. And he tr she tried. Within one week, the economy was imploding. Because populism sounds so seductive. It has an hypnotic effect. But when you go behind it to check what are the practical things to do, you realize that it doesn't go far. So we must always be careful, even as we're looking for salvation or for messianic leaders. Let's just have a far more nuanced discourse. Elections are coming, some people will be telling you you'll have 10,000 rents every month and you never ask from where. <laughs> Others will tell you from now onwards load shedding will be out if you put me this week, next week. That's the language of populism. But once you extend your mind and look at solutions, look at what has worked and what has not worked, then you begin to become more serious about statecraft. And I just want to end by saying we are at the crossroads and we must begin to think seriously about answers beyond what we are comfortable with. And South African exceptionalism has almost destroyed us. We refuse to learn from other countries what has worked, what has not worked, because we think exceptionalism we will always be this unique thing. But at the same time, I do not lose hope because deepest crises in countries have produced focused mind and solutions. Ordinary citizen now knows that there is nothing called no, let that money be stolen, it's government money. There's no money for government. It's your pay as you earn. It's your VAT. And if it is stolen, taxes will have to be increased. Mm. Certain services will stop to your inconvenience. So now we look at government. This has been a giant civic education to know that once you step back, and you look at a distance and say, that's government matter. It comes back to you one day. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Program okay. director, I don't know whether there were any questions directed. No, 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 no. Uh, we take the point about inviting community radios. We take the point about looking at the history of other stalwarts and the history before 1912. I think we'll try to focus on those issues. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are going to end it here. I promised seven and we are a minute past. Thank you very much. I know there are still some questions. Uh, Prof. Andrew, you were the prototype of questions. Apologies for cutting you off. I know uh, we, we have to engage and these are some of the lessons learned in terms of the planning, the time we, we have and so on. Apologies, and apologies to everyone. I may have uh, said something and they feel they need my apology. Um, at this point, I'm going to call on Ambassador Kotani, the chairperson of uh, the Moses Kotani Foundation, to say a few words, remarks. Ambassador.
I've been, I've been given a few minutes, and I'm not going to spend it on uh, long, what you call, uh, 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 welcoming. I'll just be brought and just say uh, good evening. Warm greetings and best wishes to you all. You've all heard what was being said. You've all contributed. We've still got work to do out there to correct the problems we are, we are facing in society. Now, uh, just to, be, uh, to cut things short, I'm speaking on behalf of the Moses Kotami Foundation, its, it's chairpersons. Because we are a unit and we don't speak as individuals, we speak as a collective. I first and foremost wish to express the profound gratitude, gratitude, gratitude of the leadership of the Moses Kotami Foundation to the following people. To all of you first for your presence, participation in today's presentation of year 2022 Moses Moani Kotami Memorial what you can lecture. Also to comrade uh, Soma Dota Fikeni for his information, informative what you call presentation of the year 2022 Moses Mwani Kotani Memorial Lecture. Also to the following parties for organizing today's Moses Mwani Kutani Memorial Lecture here at the Sanlam Hall of the Pochestrum campus of the Northwest University. To the government of the Northwest province for sponsoring the holding of today's Moses Mwani Kutani Memorial Lecture to the Pochestrum campus of the Northwest University for hosting this memorial lecture. Also for our Chief Executive Officer, Comrade Sif Mashia, for leading the holding of today's Moses Mwani Kotani Memorial Lecture. Now, uh, the Moses Kotani Foundation, of which I'm the uh, what you call a chairperson, is a village-based non-profit organization. We work with villages because we have realized that most of the Foundations are working in towns, you know. Everybody goes to town, even the village is going to town, you know. So we said, what should we do to assist what's happening in South Africa? So we said, let, let's, let us be a village-based organization, a foundation, so that we can assist people in the villages. And uh, one of the, 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 what you call, is to try and pull this flow from village to town backwards, if possible. Now, you see, this is a huge, a very huge, what you call, uh, 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 objective that we, 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 we're trying to engage in. But it's, it, it's something that can be started, and when it starts rolling, you know, 
then it can become uh, what you call uh, 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 national wines. And uh, we said that uh, as the Moses Kotani what you call foundation, we will assure that his legacy will live forever in the hearts, in the minds, and in the deeds of village people. Now, to do this, the foundation, Moses Kotani Foundation, will try to uplift poverty, unemployment, and inequality in South African villages, as well as to participate in the South African villages fight against drugs, drug, alcohol, women, and child abuse. So these are things to do with the villages, you know. You know, we go to a village, even the nearest village you go to, you see a few beautiful looking buildings, houses, just go back into them, you see a lot of poverty as it, as it, as it was highlighted. Also, what we try to do is the possibility to assist other needing foundations of the South African liberation movement, you know. We have noticed that there are a few what you call uh, 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 aims to establish foundations to serve certain causes. But they don't know where to start. They don't know who to interact with. So these are some of the things. You don't even have to, have to spend money in doing some of the things. You see, people think to do good, you have to spend money all the time. Because people who have got money makes a lot of noise, you know, about their help, the help they give. So they give you that fright that, hey, just because I've got 10 cents, I can't divide it into two and share it with somebody to move the person along. Now, the, 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 the aim of the, what you call the, 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 the Moses Kotani, what you call foundation, is to assure that the legacy of Ndate Kotani is not forgotten. Now, I don't want to go into well, a number of issues were, were mentioned here. One is the, when the, 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 in the old days when the leadership of the Communist Party was challenged at us for being too Europeanized, instead of looking at South African problems and dealing with South African problems. The other one they also forget is that, to mention is that the majority, the, the party says they stand for the, for, for the, the, for the people of South Africa. But the majority of the people of South Africa are black. And the leadership of the party was white. And this was a challenge also, you know, that how do you look? You see, you see to, to deal with a, the majority of the people, you have to understand the problems of the people. You, you can't, you must live with, amongst them, be with them, suffer with them, and no. You can't look at them from the, from the top and look down and say, yeah, but you know, it seems to me they are suffering. No, 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 you can't do it that way. 
You don't see, and it has been mentioned a number, it was the, the today a lot of issues were mentioned very, very indirectly to the same thing, that you can't deal with things from afar, you know? Because you don't know them, you don't feel them, you don't dream them, you don't sleep them, you don't eat them. <laughs> I thought you were telling me about time. Yes, I will. <laughs> you will, you will, you will, you will. Okay, let me, okay. Another thing also is that, uh, speaking about what you call uh, 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 Moses Kotani, The, 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 the Moses Kutani Foundation tries to on, 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 in an ongoing basis try to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to ensure that the, the legacy of Moses Kutani does not only prevails in or is known in uh, 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 South Africa and villages Because we have to look at him not only as a, from a, a village perspective in South Africa, but also in a broader context, because he was not only a, a leader in, in, a leader in South Africa, he was also a leader in Af of, of Africa. And finally, if the young communists, they all know that, that he was also a leader of the world, in the world. So, so as the, 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 the Moses, members of the Moses Kotani Foundation, we have to look at everything very broadly. Now, we try to also to uh, uh, advance the legacy of Moses Kotani in the villages. And this is currently being implemented uh, by the foundation with the assistance of the government of the Northwest province. Through the ongoing upholding and further unfolding of the existing Moses Kotani heritage site in Matlaku village. Now just for you to get an idea whether this is, the existing Moses Mawani Kotani heritage reburial groups, gra grave site, which is located in a, sur in, a, in a surrounding 50 by 50 meters, meter stone wall with a gate that, that was donated to the Northwest, what you call government, by the Eunice and Joseph Kotani family. That is my family. It's a big stand where we're supposed to have built our house, and when the body of Moses Kotani was brought back to South Africa, the government of the Northwest that had prepared a, a burial place, Samuel Fani, found it a bit too small. And there were negotiations done, and we said, no, okay, we are not going to build our house there. We are giving this over for the burial of Ndate uh, Kotani. Now, currently this project was also carried out by the, with the assistance of the Northwest, what you call gov uh, province government. One, the Moses Kotani, and it consisted of the Moses Kotani and Rebecca Kotani, what you call, grave site. So Moses Kotani and Rebecca Mura Kotani are buried next to each other. Not because they were husband and wife, it's because the role Makotani played in terms of the return of the body of Moses Kotani back to South Africa, which was then uh, taken up. She, she personally went to see former uh, President Zuma in his office. 
She was very insistent, you know. As, 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 as. You see, because we talk about professors and what, what, what. That doesn't scare me, you know, because I've seen what m people do, like in Tate Kotani and Me Kotani, with a low level of education, but a heart bigger than any boy, any professor here, you know. It's, 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 it's what you do, it's what you do, you know. You see, people, people open doors because you are professor so-and-so, or you're minister so-and-so, or you're this, that, that. They open the door to a title. And you think they're opening the door to you. They are not. They're opening it to a, to a title, you know. So, so, so it's, 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 we, we, we look at people from a point of view of what they are doing, how they're contributing to society, you know. I'm not saying, I'm not saying professors and other people, rich people are not contributing, they are, you know. But you see, for them it's easy to do it. No, no. <laughs> Now, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the Moses Kotkani, what you call Meme, or a grave, as you call Saita, you have the... Hmm? You are going to lose people. Why? Because they are, they are leaving. Are you leaving? No. There's one I can tell you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think, I think we, we need more time to, to go to, through all this, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah? Are you are you are you overruling him? <laughs> look, look, he's make, he's, he made a decision that I should go. They are saying I stay. Yeah, yeah, stay. There's a request because of time that uh, uh, the, the, the CEO should take over and, and present what you call whatever yes. it is. No? Yes. Okay, go. CEO, please. <laughs> Our CEO. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> no, it's this. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, good evening. I guess it's evening now. Um, mine is going to be very, very simple uh, because nako i le khona. We can't um, be keeping you here for long. Um, I've been requested by the family uh, just to uh, render an item of appreciation from the Moses Kotani family that uh, gave us Ndate Kotani who then gave us, um, you know, his life uh, in South Africa and abroad. So, Kabu Khutswani, I would like to say, um, Professor Soma Tota I, I said it right, uh, uh, MEC. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us a good lecture and for agreeing to come and uh, present this lecture. Um, to all other panelists, um, uh, the family of Ntate Kotani says, Bale Boha Kastwana. I'll just be quick uh, by saying we also have to thank the, the guests for taking your time to be with us here today and for being a very engaging you know, um, audience. Uh, I think we have learned a lot. Uh, my brother, thank you very much. We took um, uh, lessons. We'll do this better next time. Uh, it can only become better with time. But now I'll just quickly formalize uh, this, um, um, the thank you, you know, a token by formally uh, 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 thanking the Office of the Premier, 
led by Honorable Bushimape for leadership into this uh, important partnership. Equally extend the gratitude to the Northwest University for this groundbreaking partnership um, in ensuring that the legacy of Isitwa Landwe Seaparangwe Moses Kotani is well preserved and his memory is indeed uh, going to be living on. Um, I would like also to thank those that have been watching uh, from um, media platforms and all other platforms that we've been uh, broadcasting this um, lecture. And then lastly, uh, I would like to call a few people onto the stage um, just to uh, demonstrate a few, um, I mean a token of appreciation and uh, I think um, also to acknowledge M and S attorneys for also assisting us in uh, that uh, space. So without a wasting of time, because we really do not have time, I will then uh, probably ask um, uh, Professor um, um, Fikeni, uh, maybe just to stand up for us, uh, and, and, and maybe um, uh, Professor um, uh, Dirk Kotze, uh, uh, Professor Kiribone Pajo, and then um, to also ask uh, the Honorable Premier to also join in, uh, and uh, the representative of the VC uh, also to quickly join, and then to call Dr. Mavuzom Siman to join us on stage, please. Kekope uh, Josi Mautwe also to join us. Josi uh, Mutibi to also join us. Josi uh, Mabalani to also join us on stage. Josi uh, Khasiboni to also uh, join us uh, on stage. And also to ask um, uh, Ambassador jo Joseph Kotani to also uh, join us. And um, I'll say it right, uh, MEC Madota Sambata to also join us. And I will also ask Mpumi Kotani to also join us. And then I'm going to ask also uh, the two uh, COSATU representatives, uh, please do join us uh, on stage. And then Kitokopa Mepis Mabi to also join us on stage. And then Kitokopa Ntate Nathaniel Mapate to also join us on stage. And as we then um, uh, do the token of appreciation, uh, we'll also ask Jose Haseboni uh, just to come and uh, give us Le Foco Kajosi. I thank you. Okay, so after the Kosi has spoken, we are not going to speak anymore. It will be goodbye from us, and uh, let me take this opportunity to thank my fellow uh, program director who the Constitution called and assumed another role. Thank you very much, MEC Sambata, for your program uh, duties. We, 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 we realize we have this capacity. <laughs> Apparently, there, there may be an opportunity for photo ops and all of that after the uh, Hosi has spoken. Hosi, le foko Sure. Uh, Dumela ang batu mamudim. Dumela. Tlagi tena kweki lebuhe muta misatiro. Compass, 
and go ba ko mora go batho ba tshore ke tala ba mbala pile go tlo tshorela sebaka nna sa ka pela ke gore mo go rona kere eh mo rona mo go rona le ba kwa mathlaku go khosi ga tiko go go gore mongwane a tswang go teng eh re motlotlo gore go nnetsa tsere go mpira tshonang lele re ta kwala mo dibukeng tsa rona tsa kwa mathlaku tsa history gore ka date ye ya di 18 tsa november north coast university le puso ya bo kone bo phiri ma di tshoragane ba gona go tsa le ne lanta te kotane le la mama kotane ba le tsa go go dimokwa ba le bontse ba re bontse gore eh le bone ntse ba di teng ntse di selo sa ka premier o itse re kopane ne gantsi thataruwa ka ganya gore eh nta te kotane ke motho o narata gore o o arata go bona batho ba phila sentle that is why o na atsa maile le go teng go rasia go kwa ilo ba tela eh batho ba rona ba mo Africa borwa gore ba ne le freedom gore gore gona le freedom go tla go mpieno yana yana ga gona a gona gore kana le freedom re tsotse power mar sna economic freedom seke le lang sona go gore eh nta te kotane na sa batlo go bona motho a lwala a sa batlo go bona motho a tshore ke tala ana se ke kwele mo puso nya rona go mpieno ke gore a re lo tsedi tsamae mo ga re bona go gore re se ka ra dira be mo ra lecture fela go pola tsena di dira ko morago mare going forward re bona go dira yang go thusa gore tlala le lenyora le botlo ka tiro re gona yang ka legacy ya nta te kotane ke tsena se batla re tsidira bata ba 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 sebela gore ne ke re ka gore nete ke gore nga setse mo le melaetsu fo batho ba bararo mar the majority le batho utwa setswana nta to mo fana bo ba gapile a re a re le bo sekwa thata e be re se mola re sa dirisi lo tse tsi dire because se khwa ke se ke se europa se divide ka ba sa se se suta le na ke bo sekho se suta mo 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 manong wa mo ngwanong wa rona gore batlang go hodira so ka gore ya le ba gase ke re lo ke re eh se ke se kopela mo pusong ke gore a go nne le mongwa wa gore go nne le tirelo ga ke fa se ka ifela go se maotwe eh ko mo tsengwa e tsukwa matlhako motlogolo go na le o ka se fete jarateng jarateng le ngwe ko gae e le tlhare tsa nna mune tse tharo ka patse fo jarata e le ngwe fela so go pana fela gore puso e tla ba fetwa le belle gore ke re sa etse o ga tukeng tshimo e le nna mune go berekiwe batho ba jore di namune di tloge ba di khole ba di se ko marakeng ba itire di namune be sa di se ko marakeng mareko ne tempo a matlako ba re ke se di namune tseo go dirue jeme go dirue juice go fepiwe bana o mogali di tlin di lotse tsontse ke ona khanye ne mo sekotana ba tlo go dire ga so metsi ya fa pana ka di ke lotse betse bana le tsona ko motse ko mogale se sengwe se ska diruang go leka go thusa gore go nele botlhoka tiro ena ga se se pefela rona ko 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 ke bele gore rena le madi ko motse ke go gwe le khanye re dirile ya no ka ntla gore ga rena madi ena batho ba rutile gore madi ko na bere ka de swa re kopa gore a go nne le thusa mofuta o gore gone go bona gore di chabatsano di a kopile ka mafoka ne ke rata gore ba gaetswe ke re ke ke le bogile CEO ya Muscot Foundation ke le bogetse gore o gone gore go e tirwa ka jikwe ne successfully e premier le botlhe ba le ntefa ba gaetswe le bogile a pula le nele ke le bo Sambat. So